Okay, so let's uh, talk about the last uh, big component uh, of uh, interconnection networks, and last but not the least, it's buffering and flow control. And again, as I said, this is tightly coupled with the routing strategy as well as the topology. Uh, maybe less the topology, but routing and uh, buffering and flow control, they're very much coupled with each other. Topology usually determines what kind of routing algorithm you want to implement. Okay, this is, uh, we already discussed some of this, circuit versus packet switching. Actually, this choice affects a lot of your buffering, buffering and flow control decisions. Circuit switching, you set up the path, you don't need any buffers, basically. If you're operating in this mode, that's great. You don't need any flow control because your flow control is handled by setting up the path and isolating it from anything else. Flow control happens only to ensure that somebody else cannot use what path, that path. So there's still some flow control in there, but, uh, but uh, it's a lot simpler. Packet switching, on the other hand, you may or may not need buffers in this case, and you definitely need some flow control uh, in this case. So, Circuit switching and packet switching is definitely uh, something that affects your buffering and flow control. Uh, let's, uh, I'm going to focus more on packet switching uh, for the rest, but a lot of the things that we really discussed is uh, applicable also to uh, circuit switching. Uh, so b basically, if you want to do some sort of packet switching or communication, you need to have a message format. Uh, and I'll call it the packet format. This is boring. Uh, clearly, you need to have some sort of header in the message that encodes your destination, for example, or some routing and control information. If you're doing source-based routing, the entire path. Uh, if you're doing circuit switching, uh, which circuit that you're using, etc. So you need to have some sort of header, control information. You need to have the payload. Payload is whatever you want to communicate, basically. Uh, that's it's a cache block or a control message or a coherence message. It carries data. Uh, it can be further divided into stuff which I'm not going to go into. And uh, you can have error codes also, like a checksum, so that, people, uh, so that the receiving routers or intermediate routers can check that this is still correct. Right? You, could, you could basically have a checksum on the header and the payload, right? or you could have separate, separate checksums on the header and, or the payload. Uh, and it's gener generally at the tail of the packet, so it can be generated on the way out, basically, because you've already received everything. You just need to do the checksum some sort of error correction calculation, and then ch check it with the tail of the packet. OK. Uh, so that's the boring part, maybe. <laughs> I mean, all sort of networks need to have some sort of packet format. The more interesting part is uh, this question. We need to handle contention somehow in a network, especially in a router. And we're going to go into the building of routers in a little bit. Uh, we're not going to go too much into it, I think. but. Uh, Basically, if you have two packets that are trying to use the link, same link at the same time, what do you do? By the way, feel free to circulate around so that people can have multiple rounds. <laughs> you, can, you can do the routing of uh, uh, the Turkish delight. <laughs> That's the packet. <laughs> and then you can run around and uh, lose, some lose some weight as well, <laughs> if you have extra weight. <laughs> okay, so then the question is, what do you do? Two packets uh, coming from different uh, input ports are trying to go to uh, the same output port. What are your choices? Well, we've discussed one choice, buffering one, right? You could buffer one of the packets and let the other one use the link in the, uh, in the next cycle. And then in the next cycle, you take the buffered one and send it out. Are there other choices? Any questions? Any thoughts? What else can you do? Yes? You can drop one, right? And then, of course, tell, some, tell the sender to resend it. So this comes with some complexity. You need to communicate back to the sender saying that you drop one, unless you don't care. But in most cases, you care, actually. <laughs> so you need to tell the sender, which means that you need to have a communication path, reliable communication path back to the sender. And you cannot drop a lot on that communication path. <laughs> Because otherwise, you run into this problem. You keep dropping packets, and you never send the packet. What else? Any other choices? Buffer, drop, yes? I mean, you could also drop it and uh, implement reliable transport on top of the unreliable. So have acknowledgments from the destination instead of from the dropping path. OK, how would you do that? 
sort of like TCP with acknowledgments that are numbered. That's true, yes, that's true, basically. Yeah, yeah, that's one way of actually uh, handling the dropping, you're right. Yeah, there are multiple ways of handling the dropping. You may not need to notify the center, but maybe the destination somehow figures out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Although the first time you're sending the packet to form that connection, you still need some reliable path to the sender, right? Because the, uh, the receiver doesn't even know what, that they're going to receive things. <laughs> But yeah, that's good. So dropping actually has a lot of complexity, as you can see. <laughs> Buffering is a lot easier, perhaps. But it's a choice, yes? One for the center packet on the wrong link. Exactly. The third one is actually misroute one. We've already covered this, actually. It's called deflection, also. You don't send it to the link that it needs to really go to, productive link, but you send it back, let's say. It's coming from here. OK, I don't want it. Get it back, right? Or some other link that's free. So these are three fundamental choices. I don't know if there's any other choice. Any other choice would be a combination of these, these things, I think. And there are trade-offs associated with this. And we're going to look at these trade-offs. Clearly, buffering requires buffers. Dropping requires some sort of communication to the sender. Uh, misrouting requires something else. Eventually, you need to route it correctly, right? You need to ensure there is no live lock. But if you actually do dropping, you can get rid of buffers. If you actually do misrouting, you can also get rid of buffers. Right. So that's, that's the upside. Uh, and you could use this in a combination. If your buffer is full, you can start dropping. Or if your buffer is full, you can start misrouting. Right. So there are very interesting trade-offs over here. We're going to talk about that. But let's talk about some flow control methods. So uh, this is, you can think of this as buffering and flow control merged together. Basically, we're controlling some flow. Uh, one f f sort of flow control met method is circuit switching, as we've discussed. You set up the circuit and control the flow into that circuit. Bufferless is another flow control method. We're going to look at store forward, virtual cut through, and wormhole. Uh, circuit switching, uh, revisited. The idea is to pre-allocate the resources across multiple routers for a given flow. When I say router, it's the same as a switch. Basically, you need to send a probe to set up the path for pre-allocation. Resource allocation granularity is high in this case. The allocation granularity is an entire path, and no one else can use that path. But the big upsides are there's no need for buffering, no contention for that particular flow. Flow's performance is completely isolated at that point. Latency is low, as we've discussed, and you can handle arbitrary message sizes. Actually, once you uh, start the circuit between the source and destination, you can send megabytes and megabytes of data. Right. You just need to break it into packets or the flow control units. Well, whatever the network can transmit. The downside is you get lower link utilization because two flows cannot use the same link at the same time. And you have the handshake overhead to set up a circuit, as we've discussed. So that's one way. Uh, the other way, another way, is bufferless deflection routing. We're going to look at this a little bit more. Uh, basically, you don't have any buffers in the router. When the two packets contend for the same link, one is deflected. This is actually a really old idea. Uh, this is a seminal paper that introduced this idea among many, many other ideas in distributed communication networks. Uh, they are also called it hot, hot potato routing. You can think of this as a packet being a hot potato. No one can hold it for too long. You cannot buffer it. You basically send the potato to someone else, to your neighbor. And you don't care who you send it to. Basically, you just want to get rid of the potato because it's too hot. Uh, and the idea is very simple when two packets want to let's say you go through the same destination in this case, and they arrive at the same router over here. The router doesn't have buffers. The router sends one to the destination, but sends the other one to a non-productive output port. So the blue one is basically taking the scenic route, if you will, here, over here. It's taking the longer route, but eventually it's reaching desti its destination. So we're going to revisit this. It's nice. Uh, so new traffic can be injected whenever there's a free output link. So you're actually monitoring the output links because you don't have buffers. You just monitor which links are free or which links are not free and uh, inject based on that. So basically, this is uh, a buffered router. If you have buffers, the buffers actually look like this. Uh, we're going to go into a little bit more detail later on. Uh, but if you have, a def if you do, def uh, basically, it's a mesh router. It's a 5 by 5 router. You have four neighbors and the local injection ports and four ejection ports, output ports, and the local to, the, uh, to that particular endpoint. So it's a 5x5 five five router. It's relatively complicated. 
And if you do deflection routing, you get rid of the buffers, essentially. You, you buffer the packets in the links, or links act as buffers, if, if you think about it that way, and pipeline latches. Of course, you have pipelining, and you need to have latches to ensure there's pipelining. So the deflection routing logic becomes a little bit simpler. But we will, we will revisit this uh, tomorrow. So there are a bunch of issues in bufferless deflection routing. Because it's non-minimal adaptive, non-minimal because you can send it to a non-productive output port, you have live lock. You actually have router complexity issues, which we will talk about, uh, because it's not as easy because you need to solve the live lock problem. Live lock is not easy to handle. Uh, so buffered networks have the deadlock problem. Bufferless networks have the live lock problem. Uh, uh, so, and they're not as e e either one is e not easy to handle. But you need to handle it. And also, there's another issue with bufferless networks, which is performance and congestion at high loads. We will talk about that. And if you're interested, you can read this uh, book chapter that talks about a lot of related issues, although this is not the, uh, up, up, uh, as up-to-date as you can see over here. OK, so let's take a look at other store forward control, uh, so other control, flow control method, methods that are assuming buffering. So we're going to assume buffering right now. We're going to assume packet-based networks. Store and forward is an early method that's developed. Uh, to uh, do the buffering. Basically, you copy the entire packet into the router before moving to the next node, before you send the packet to the next node. Basically, the flow control unit is the entire packet over here. And you wait for the entire packet to arrive. So let's say this is your source to this destination. Uh, if you want to do that, you need to wait for the entire packet before you can route it. This leads to high per packet latency. And it requires buffering for the entire packet in each node. So let's take a look at this. Basically, source has the packet. Because it has the packet, it can now route it to the, to the next router. So we have a routing algorithm. It says, send the packet to the next router. And basically, you send the packet over four cycles because the packet is bigger than the link. It takes four cycles to send the packet. And this router cannot route the packet before it receives the entire packet. And then once it receives the entire packet, it can start routing. And this router receives it after four more cycles. This router cannot route the packet until it receives the entire packet. And then it goes like this. So it's slow, as you can see. You need to wait for the entire packet. Uh, and this is how networks used to be designed uh, some, at some point in time. But this is not very high performance, as you can see. Although it has the advantage that uh, you know that the pa entire packet is there before you start routing it. So it's, it may be more reliable. The key, key, key question is, can we do better? And the answer is yes. So this is another form of uh, flow control. It's called cut-through flow control. You basically start forwarding as soon as the header is received and resources are allocated. Basically, you have the packet at the source, and there's a huge reduction in latency. It can still allocate buffers and channel bandwidth for full packets. That's your cut-through allocates buffers and channel, channel bandwidth for full packets. Let's take a look at it. Uh, so it basically sent the header. You, you break the packet into header, body, and tail. And then now packet is distributed across routers, right? The header can go before uh, the full packet is received. And the body and tail are in different places. So you can see that uh, the header uh, is uh, everywhere. Uh, well, now the, the packet can be distributed across the network. So this is good because your latency is reduced. Header is received uh, very quickly. And the packet is overall received uh, quick, uh, well, the, the tail is received late, of course. But there is a large reduction in latency. But we still allocate buffers and channel bandwidth for full packets in this case, which means that you're really wasting resources. Uh, even though you don't need uh, the, so for example, at this point, you don't need allocation of the buffer for the entire packet over here. You still allocate for the entire packet. That's true here. That's true here. So it's wasting a lot of resources. So the key question is, can we do better? Uh, and we, we're going to do better in a little bit. So what to do if the output port is blocked? Uh, uh, so the cut-through flow control lets the tail continue when the head is blocked, absorbing the whole message into a single switch. Basically, it requires a large, large enough buffer to hold the largest packet. Essentially, uh, so if the output port is blocked uh, somewhere over here, actually, I don't have that animation over here, sorry. Uh, uh, but basically, the entire message needs to be buffered. In the, uh, in the router, which requires a buffer large enough to hold the largest packet. And it, as a result, degenerates to store and forward flow control with high contention. So not good. So the key question is, can we do better? 
And the better is actually wormhole flow control. In this case, uh, you don't do flow control and resource buffer allocation at the packet granularity, but you do it at a much smaller granularity. And the granularity is really the flit granularity. That's the buffer and bandwidth allocation unit. That's, called flow con that's why it's called flow control digit. So you can have a header uh, and body flits and tail flit. And in each uh, router over here, you have resource only for the flit that you're buffering. So you have only one flit that's buffered. You have w one buffer that's allocated for this flit, one buffer that's allocated for this flit, and one buffer that's allocated for that flit. You don't need buffering for the entire packet because you do the buffer allocation at a very much smaller granularity. It's a very simple idea. And uh, flits are sent across the fabric in a wormhole fashion. That's why it's called wormhole flow control. So it's, if you think about this, this looks like a worm. The head of the worm is here. The body is distributed across some routers. And the tail is at the very end. So basically, body follows head, tail follows body. It's pipelined. If head is blocked, rest of packet stops. And the interesting thing is routing or source and destination information are, is only kept in the head. So basically, head leaves some breadcrumbs, if you will, to, to ensure that body and tail gets routed in the right way. So you need to have some uh, state uh, that's, uh, that's in previous routers for that purpose. So how does body and tail know where to go? Essentially, that's what I said. You need to have a previous state, and that makes it a little bit more complicated. But in this case, latency is almost independent of distance for long messages because you're actually pipelining the entire packet across the network. That's not completely true, of course, but now you are, your, your header can actually reach the destination very quickly and body and pipe, uh, uh, tail flow. So the big advantage over store and forward flow control is you get lower latency and more efficient buffer utilization. You don't need to allocate buffers for the entire packet. Limitations, of course, this also suffers from limitations, which is called head of line blocking. If head flit cannot move due to contention, another worm cannot proceed, even though links may be idle. And I will give that example. Uh, to you. This is really a problem with first in, first out uh, queues. You have these input queues, you have these outputs, and you have this router switching fabric. Uh, and mm, this is uh, input port one, input port two, and this is where things should go, output ports. This should go to output port one, this should go to output port two, this should go to output port one. If you look at this, both of the head uh, the, head, uh, the flits that are at the head of these input queues, they both need to go to output port one, right? So you send that one. In the same cycle, you cannot send this one uh, because if you look at just the head, uh, head of the queue, they both want to go to one. If you do the arbitration just by looking at the first thing uh, uh, in the input queues, both of these Flits want to go to output port one. Uh, as a result, you send this one, you buffer this one, but you're not aware that there's someone else that wants to go to output port two because you're doing arbitration just based on the heads over here. Right. This is called head of line blocking. It's kind of not nice. Actually, if you were doing, if you were looking at all of the possible flits over here and deciding what to route, this wouldn't happen. Basically, if you were looking at, uh, in this input queue, you were looking at all of them, and you're picking one, uh, the, the head, head to go to output port one. Here, you do arbitration also. You say, oh, output one, port one is already allocated, so I'm going to look at output port two. Is there anyone who needs output port two? If that's the case, then you can actually send it over here. But that arbitration actually becomes more complex. It's, called, it's really out of order scheduling. It's a little bit more complex, actually, than out of order scheduling. And people don't want to build, didn't want to build routers that way. So we, we're going to solve this problem in, a, in some other simpler way. And the idea is, uh, uh, well, actually, I, I'm going to demonstrate this a little bit more. Idea is going to be virtual uh, uh, channels. Basically, a worm can be before uh, another in the router input buffer due to the FIFO nature. That's really the fundamental problem. The second worm cannot be scheduled, even though it may need to access another output port, completely separate output port, right? So let's take a look at it over here. Let's assume that uh, this link is blocked by other packets over here. So this green one cannot move. As a result, this purple one cannot move also. So this blue one is making progress. The buffer is full over here. The blue one cannot proceed. Right. And as a result, it's blocked. Even though, uh, so OK, uh, it's blocked over here. 
And then the red one comes in. This channel is idle completely, but the red packet is blocked behind the blue one. Blue one needs to go this way, red one needs to go this way. But the red one cannot make progress over here because uh, the blue one is blocking it in the FIFO queue. So you may think that, oh, this is stupid. Why don't we have an arbiter that's more complex? And yes, that's right. <laughs> you need to have an arbiter that's more complex, but if you, you don't want to increase complexity too much. Uh, and then the red holds this channel. The channel remains idle until uh, the, the red one proceeds over there. So one solution to this is called virtual channel flow control. Uh, the idea is very simple. Uh, you don't have a single FIFO queue to look at, to arbitrate. You basically have multiple FIFO queues for each input port. That's the idea. It looks like this, basically. This is your input port. As opposed to having a single FIFO queue, which is uh, vulnerable to the set of line blocking, you have multiple FIFO queues. Or you can think of it as multiplexing multiple channels over one physical channel. You divide up the input buffer into multiple single, uh, simple buffers. Now you, of course, have the question, whenever you get a packet or flit, which Q do you put it in? Now you actually, they're, 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 you, if you want to minimize head of line blocking, you need to be a little bit more intelligent, but I'm not going to go into the details of that. Now we are making the router more complex, right? And that's the paper that introduced the idea. So you can think of it this way. You have 16 flit FIFO buffers. As opposed to having a single FIFO buffer, you have four, uh, four, uh, four flit uh, FIFO buffers. And now you can actually, you, you do the arbitration on the uh, head of these, each of the queues. So you, can act, you have actually four things to choose. Here you have, uh, you can choose only one thing. Looks like my battery died here. Here you can choose only the head over here. As a result, you're vulnerable to head of line blocking. And I cannot find that. OK, yeah, you can choose only this. Now you can choose only four of those. If you actually had complete out of order scheduling, you could choose any 16, right? But that's expensive. OK, so basically, virtual channel flow control enables you to have two smaller queues. If you're blocked by other packets over here, that's OK. Your buffer can, can become full. Blue cannot proceed over here. But now there's a queue for the red one. And the red one can proceed. It's not blocked anymore. But now we made the router more complicated. A modern virtual channel-based router looks like this. And we're going to stop in a little bit. But basically, you need, to, uh, you need to manage these input buffers, the virtual channels. You need to decide where to put uh, an input flow. And then you need to do the arbitration. There's lot routing logic. Essentially, you need to have a virtual channel allocator. You need to have a switch allocator to, to figure out which virtual channel would, should be input into the split, uh, into the switch, and how should the switch be configured. And of course, you need to do the route computation logic. And there's also another thing. You need to actually handle uh, there's something that's coming in, credits in. This is credit-based control flow, uh, flow control. This basically said, can you actually send something to the downstream router? Does the downstream router has enough buffers to handle things? Because that needs to be communicated somehow, and that's not as easy. And that's true for all routers. All routers need to communicate to the upstream routers whether they have buffer availability. Yes? Um, why not have the buffers on the output port? Uh, say it again. Why not have the buffers? Already the cost already like you can already the difference. Yeah, why not have buffers over here? You're asking. Right? You could actually. Okay. You could have them uh, in either way. You could have both input and output, or just output, or just input. Uh, and there are different trade offs associated with it. You can think about the trade offs. Actually, just output buffer routers are not as easy because you need to uh, handle the arbitration before, right? But you could. No question about that. I just, I'm just showing something without the output buffers over here. OK, let's see. How much do I want to cover this? Oh, OK, let's cover this very quickly. So basically, there are other uses of virtual channels. Uh, one is deadlock avoidance. You can enforce switching to a different set of virtual channels on some turns. And that way, you can break the cyclic dependency of resources. Actually, if you have a virtual channel, you can steer traffic to another virtual channel. You can enforce order on the virtual channels. And you can have escape virtual channels, have at least one virtual channel that uses deadlock free routing. Everything else uses deadlock, not non deadlock free routing. You can ensure each fleet has fair access to that virtual channel. That's another way of handling deadlock, but it's more complicated now, right? You increase the buffering, you increase the virtual channels, and 
you have multiple routing algorithms in this case. There's also another issue, protocol level deadlock, uh, that can be handled by virtual channels. Protocol level deadlock means, uh, essentially, uh, you may have different packet classes, requests and replies, and you may have a deadlock because uh, th those, are, those are preventing each other's delivery. And you can ensure that those different data packets use different virtual channels such that they don't prevent each other. Uh, and you can, uh, since we don't have time, I'm not going to go into that much detail. This virtual channels enable prioritization of different traffic classes. Some virtual channels may have higher priority than others. Uh, and as a result, you can actually differentiate between different traffic classes. So that's another use of virtual, uh, different virtual channels. Okay, so let's review flow control very quickly. Store and forward was like this. You needed to allocate uh, uh, things at the packet granularity. I need to do the routing at the packet granularity also, which was slow and high buffer overhead. You shrink buffers, reduce latency. You get to cut through and warm hold. I'm going to handle them similarly. Uh, and then there are other issues over, uh, over here, which is head of line blocking. And we solved the head of line blocking by using uh, virtual channels. And we, I've already animated this. This is head of line blocking. And if you actually use virtual channels, you can get rid of that head of line blocking. But actually, as we went from here to here, we increased the complexity. Even though we improved uh, some of the buffering and reducing latency, we actually made the buffer management more complex. Okay. So there's a lot of complexity involved, and we built a, essentially almost a state-of-the-art router with the picture that I've shown you. Uh, one thing that we didn't discuss is you need to communicate whether a buffer is available or not. Right? If you actually want to allocate, if you want to send a packet to a downstream router, you should know whether a buffer is available. If not, then you may have a problem, right? especially if, you have, uh, if, you, if you're relying on buffer availability. So these are the different flow control methods that are used to communicate buffer availability upstream. Uh, Credit-based, on and off, ACK or NAC. So essentially credit-based flow control says upstream routers know how many buffers are available downstream. The downstream routers that are receiving the packets pass back credits to the upstream saying I have this, much, this many buffers available. Uh, and this leads to a lot of signaling uh, between the routers. So there needs to be another network that carries these credits. Uh, just to ensure that buffering is done correctly. So it's a lot of overhead, as you can see. Uh, we will see an example of this in a little bit. Uh, on and off, uh, and also there's delay, right? Uh, uh, of course, you may be sending a lot of packets downstream, but other people may be sending a lot of uh, packets to the same router. And the router needs to be conservative, because it may actually receive packets from different routers at the same time. So it needs to be conservative in communicating how many buffers it actually has, right? It cannot tell you that it has a lot of buffers, and then uh, it runs out of buffers. So there's some delay associated with uh, this credit communication, as well as there are multiple different routers communicating with the same router, so that needs to be taken into account. As a result, your buffering becomes more conservative. You need to over-provision your buffers, or you run out, run out of buffers more quickly. You basically quickly say, oh, I don't have buffers. Right. So there's a danger here. That's why a lot of the buffering is over-provisioned in high-performance networks today. Uh, so the on and off flow control is a different method. It basically says, stop sending me messages, uh, packets, because I don't have buffers. Or now you can start sending me uh, packets. It's on and off, basically. It's different from how many buffers I have. I have credits or not. ACNAC is essentially, ACNAC uh, means uh, upstream buffer optimistically, uh, up, upstream router optimistically sends uh, the packet to downstream router, uh, but it cannot deallocate the buffer until it receives an ACK or NAC. Right. But of course, this may have downsides like inefficient utilization of buffer space. But they all have downsides in the end. Okay, let's take a look at credit based flow control. Unless uh, you have node one and node two over here. Uh, Let's assume that node, uh, node 2, uh, at some point, a flit leaves the router. Now we have one buffer available. And uh, at time t1, node 2 sends a credit to node 1. Of course, in this case, it's just node 2 and node 1, right? What if you have node 2 and node 1, node, two, node 3, node 4, node 5 that can potentially send to node 2? So you need to send credits to all of them. The question is, how much credit do you need to send? So if you, don't, if you have only one buffer, you cannot tell everyone that you have one buffer. Because now everyone will send you, you will receive three packets in the next cycle. You cannot do that. So you need to over-provision your buffers. Or you need to be very conservative when you're sending credits. Either way, 
Either you improve, uh, reduce your energy efficiency because you have a lot of buffering or area cost, or you basically uh, do not utilize your network very well because you tell everyone, I don't have buffers, uh, even though they may not be sending you anything. Right? OK, so you, you also see that there's a delay associated with this credit round trip. So this, uh, this node basically uh, will think for some time that it doesn't have a credit. There's also that round trip delay. So it processes that credit, and it sends a flit to the next node. And once it sends a flit, it has one buffer available, so it passes the credit back to upstream routers. Again, the same issue exists over here. And then once this node gets the flit, it processes it, and there is a round trip delay associated with even a single uh, a flit sending, as you can see over here. Basically, you need to, we have a flit, you need to wait for a credit, and then you send the flit, and then only after that it takes some time uh, to fill the buffer, as you can see over here. So during, from here to here, your buffer is really uh, empty, if you will, for all practical purposes. So you're underutilizing this buffer, and because of this credit round trip delay, Plus, on top of that, this is just one node and two nodes communicating. So you need to over provision your buffers. This is why buffering becomes a little bit unwieldy if you, if you want to have high performance. OK, basically, time between when the buffer empties and when next flip can be processed from that buffer entry. That's, that's uh, credit round trip delay or round trip credit delay. This leads to significant throughput de degradation if there are few buffers available. That's why the high performance network over provision their buffers. And of course, it's important to size the buffers to tolerate this credit uh, turnaround. This also called turnaround uh, uh, delays. OK. So let's take a look at another example of this uh, buffering. Uh, this is on-off flow control. Uh, again, we have node 1 and node 2. Uh, downstream router node 2 has an on-off signal to upstream uh, to tell the upstream, you can send the buffer. Uh, you can send me the flit right now. So node 1 sends a flit. Uh, and there, uh, because, of, because of that flit uh, receive, received by node 2, uh, the off threshold uh, gets reached. And node 2 tells, OK, I don't have any buffers anymore, so stop sending me. Of course, you need to be careful here. Uh, you need to send the signal again conservatively, because if you send it too late, again, a lot of uh, nodes may send you flits, and you may not have buffers, right? You need to basically uh, turn off yourself conservatively. And as you can see, that's the conservatism, right? So, so the flit may be uh, still being received over here. So there's some, uh, uh, there's some slack that you need to build into this off signal. This off signal assumes that, oh, I'm going to receive some more flits. Uh, that's why I'm going to send the off signal even earlier. OK, so there's some processing delay. And then, uh, yeah, basically, uh, this, uh, this off threshold is set to prevent flits arriving before uh, uh, T4 uh, from overflowing. Yeah. Basically, that's not written very well, but basically you need to ensure that the buffers in node 2 uh, do not overflow. So you need to uh, turn off, uh, set that signal uh, at, the, at the right time. Which means that you need to over provision your buffers again, right? Uh, or you don't utilize your buffers really well. OK, and then once uh, node 2 starts sending flits, after some point, you t turn on, uh, basically you, you have enough buffers uh, in this node, and then you can now turn it back on and send an on signal back to any upstream uh, router. OK, basically it goes on like this. And then now you can keep sending flits, and that processes, and then this can keep receiving flits. OK, makes sense, right? And this on and off signals are set such that you never overflow these buffers. And as a result, you have uh, conservatism, and your, your buffers become large. So buffer management is not easy. Basically, that's the whole point over here. And you have a lot of buffers, uh, especially in complex topologies. This becomes not easy. In a mesh, uh, you, have, you, you really have four places where you can receive uh, uh, flits from. Actually, five places, right? The input node and northeast, southwest routers. I, I've just shown you one. You need to actually manage all of these on-off signals for all of them. OK, I didn't look at ACNAC, but ACNAC actually has similar uh, problems. OK, so we'll get back to buffering. Uh, let's talk about uh, evaluating interconnection network performance. Now that we're done with the real basics, performance is also basics. And I've given you this figure before, right? We talked about load latency curve. This is essentially the load latency curve. Usually, if you want to look at an interconnect, you think of it this way. There is some injection rate to the interconnect. 
and um, that injection rate can be expressed in different rates. One way of expressing it could be how many flits per node per cycle are being injected, right? Uh, and you can have a number based on a workload or based on some particular synthetic pattern as we've discussed last time, like a uniform random pattern. Uh, and that can go from, I guess, zero to whatever. There's another way of expressing this, basically. That it's also called uh, how, how loaded the system is. It's fraction of the total uh, buffer space and the link space that is utilized. Or, and that there's a percentage over here, like maybe 60% uh, of all of the buffer space is utilized. You can, you can, uh, you can also express the load of the network that way. And you may, you may see that in some works. But basically this says, how frequently are you injecting into the network? Uh, on the y-axis, you have the latency. That could be average packet latency or maximum packet latency. Uh, let's talk about average packet latency. Uh, and then you have a curve that looks like this usually. Essentially, you have some point where, where you're not injecting anything. You have some uh, mm, uh, latency that's minimal. Right? That's called zero load latency. Of course, if you're not injecting anything, how do you measure something? You don't. <laughs> Basically, this is assuming that uh, some traffic pattern, if the network is not loaded, how long will it take uh, for uh, the packet to go from uh, a source to a destination? Right? That's what the zero load latency means. And if you keep uh, increasing the load, your latency increases because there's contention. And at some point, uh, at some point what happens is uh, network essentially saturates. So this asymptote over here is called saturation throughput. Uh, and at that point, your latency shoots up. Uh, sometimes it's called also congestion collapse in the internet, for example. Basically, the network collapses because of congestion. The latencies are, become too unreasonable at some point. So that's the saturation throughput of the network given a traffic pattern. So this curve is not the same for every traffic pattern, clearly, right? If the traffic pattern is uniform random, meaning any node can communicate with any node in a uniform random manner, that's very different traffic pattern compared to nearest neighbor. Nearest neighbor means uh, a, a node is communicating only with its left neighbor, let's say, or right neighbor. That is not uh, putting a lot of strain on the network buffers, links, whatever you have, which means that the curve for nearest neighbor probably looks like this. Right? It saturates very, very late, if it saturates at all. At some point it saturates because you you're run out of links and buffers, right? But the, the, tra uh, the, the, the curve for uniform random looks more closer to here, basically. It saturates much more quickly because every node is sending uh, packets uniformly, randomly to every other node. That's clearly putting a lot more strain on the entire network's resources compared to nearest neighbor traffic. So there are a bunch of different traffic patterns that people analyze. Of course, real patterns are somewhere in between probably, right? OK, so let's take a look at how the fundamentals that we've discussed affect this curve. Because if you think about it, this curve, assuming the traffic pattern, uh, let's, let's pick uniform random. Uniform random is interesting because it's, it basically makes every node equal, and there is no a predictable communication pattern in the network. You can think of it as a worst case pattern. It's not really a worst case pattern, actually. It just basically is a load balancing pattern. One of the worst case patterns could be a hotspot pattern, right? Hotspot is you have actually, let's say you have a mesh. You have one node that's a hotspot, and everybody's sending mess messages to that node. That saturates the network, actually, much earlier than uniform random in general. So you, you see a curve that looks like this very quickly. And if everybody's sending, uh, injecting into the network at a very high rate to that particular hotspot, things get actually congested much, much worse. That's why your routing algorithm is very important, especially if, with those hotspot patterns. OK. So let's assume one particular uh, injection pattern, uh, workload pattern. How, how is this curve? What, what determines this curve? Basically, there's some minimum latency that's really given by your topology. You cannot go beyond that. Right. Your minimum latency, this is actually your diameter, especially your topology's diameter. If your diameter is low, your minimum latency is usually low. If your diameter is high, your minimum latency is high. So topology is very fundamental, as you can see. And on top of that, there is some inefficiency because of your routing algorithm, because you don't necessarily do a good job in routing. Or there is some latency in routing, fundamentally, that affects your minimum latency. So routing algorithm affects that. And on top of that, there's flow control mechanisms, just like we've discussed. All of the buffering overheads, uh, uh, yeah, essentially buffering overheads or the management overheads of the flow, 
that adds to your minimum latency. As a result, you get to this point. So topology, routing algorithm, and uh, flow control all together get you to a point over here. Okay, so that's, what, that's your zero load latency over here. So let's take a look at throughput. Throughput is also, again, bounded by topology over here. Topology bounds your throughput. You cannot go beyond some throughput if your topology is not good enough. And on top of that, you have some inefficiency in your routing because your routing algorithm is not perfect. There's some delay, there's, uh, and it's not high throughput, perhaps. And then you lose some throughput because of that. And then on top of that, you lose some throughput because of your flow control mechanisms. And as a result, you're, uh, you, you reach this asymptote over here. So you're bounded by two asymptotes, the latency asymptote and the throughput asymptote. And they're all affected by, firstly, your topology, and then your routing algorithm, and then your flow control uh, mechanisms. It's good to think about that. Of course, it's hard to uh, exactly figure out uh, what contributes how much to it, and that's part of the design of the network, basically. You want to design a network based on your requirements that minimize these inefficiencies as much as possible. Okay, so I've already said that this is the zero load latency and that's the saturation throughput. Okay, so basically a ring topology is very different from a mesh topology if you think about it. Minimum latency of a ring is uh, much larger for a uniform random traffic pattern compared to a mesh. And we've discussed that. And definitely a point-to-point uh, -point network is, uh, its minimum latency is much lower, right? Its diameter is one. Uh, and there is no switches that are involved uh, in that transmission. Okay, so ideal latency, we'll go through this very quickly basically, uh, but this is solely due to the wire delay between the source and destination. Usually you want to approximate ideal latency and point to point is getting very close to that, right? You have only a wire between a source and destination hopefully, but even there, there's some arbitration delay actually because you need to figure out which wire to put uh, uh, put your message into, right? Because you have many, many wires connecting yourself to uh, many other routers, uh, ma ma many other destinations. Uh, but uh, this is the ideal latency. There is some distance, the distance between two points measured along axes at right angles, Manhattan distance. Uh, and then there's some propagation velocity of the signal. And you have that D divided by V. And also you have some packets, right? You have a packet size and channel bandwidth, and you basically put some number of flits. So that's the ideal latency, and you can study it. It's not that interesting in the end. Uh, but on top of ideal latency, you have overheads. Actual latency is, uh, you don't have dedicated wires only, but you actually have router latency. So there's uh, additional router latency and the number of hops that you need to travel, plus uh, latency due to contention. And this router latency can be broken down into more, uh, but I'm not going to do that. It's, it's, it's not just the routing latency, but it's also the credit router flow control latency. So there's a lot uh, that goes into the router latency also. And certainly the latency due to contention is not so easy also because it depends on the contention patterns, right? Okay, so this, this is what uh, a latency uh, and throughput curve looks like. Uh, this, this doesn't have to be on-chip network, but this slide happened to be on-chip network. But basically this is the fraction of the capacity of the network uh, uh, that is occupied, injected, and this is latency. And the curve looks like this usually. And the ideal, you would like this perhaps, right? Maybe this is your really minimum latency. Of course, you could argue that ideal should be much closer to here, but ideally you, you shouldn't saturate, right? But you do saturate because your network is not ideal. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, let's look at some network performance metrics. Uh, we've talked about packet latency. Round trip latency could be another one. Uh, and packet latency could, could be average and maximum. Uh, round trip latency is not just packet latency, but request response latency. You send a request and you get a response. What is the round trip delay for that? And saturation throughput we also talked about. So these are actually very uh, traditional performance metrics that people use, and you can actually gather them from here. But I think uh, actually uh, a lot of works, especially uh, in on-chip networks, more recently I focused on application level performance, system performance, and this is really important as you know uh, by now. This is affected by interference among threads and applications also. So this is really important to consider. So we'll take a more application level view. And if you actually think about the applications, maybe there's a different way of designing networks. In the past people actually thought about traffic patterns and uh, looked at traffic patterns and the network's performance based on those traffic patterns. 
that's good, interesting, but you don't know whether those traffic patterns are actually going to be the real patterns that are going to be used in your network. If you look at an on-chip network, actually, there are real workloads that are running on that network, and you can actually design your network to the requirements of, that, of those workloads. So that brings up to on-chip networks. I'll talk about on-chip a little bit. Uh, everything we've discussed is much more general, actually. Actually, what we're going to discuss is also much more general than on-chip, but I'm going to motivate it based on on-chip, because it's, uh, as I said, today, today's systems are actually distributed systems on-chip. So if you look at on-chip networks, these are networks that today connect cores, caches, memory controllers, and other components, accelerators. Uh, and buses and crossbars are some types of networks, but usually they're not scalable. So people have been looking at things like rings, hierarchical rings, uh, and meshes, uh, or tori. But you can think of it this way. You have routers, and you have processing elements, and processing elements can contain cores, banks, memory controllers, etc., or accelerators. Usually they're packet switched, but you could have circuit switching mechanisms. Uh, and uh, two-dimensional mesh has been most commonly used topology in especially the scalable prototypes. This doesn't mean it's not necessarily a good topology. It's easy to do, right? It's, it's easy to lay out. And you can imagine why. It looks like this. It's very regular. You basically uh, stamp out a bunch of tiles. Uh, but uh, one, one thing that's fundamental is uh, the on-chip network primarily serves cache misses and memory requests. So if you look at these processing elements, they usually have L1 caches internally. So they have some locality that's already filtered. And those L1 caches do not communicate. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, only the cache misses uh, uh, get served over here, and the memory requests get served over here, and some coherence requests, of course. But if you have the MESI protocol, if you're uh, modifying uh, your data exclusively, you know that nobody else has the data, so you, you don't actually need to send a coherence message uh, to uh, anybody else, right? Once you, once, you exclusive, once you have exclusive access to the data that you're modifying, you don't need to keep it coherent. OK, so certainly there's coherence request over here that should be added. So this is another picture over here. And this is the router that we've seen. And it's very similar to what I showed you earlier. So let's talk about on-chip versus off-chip a little bit. Uh, there are on-chip ad advantages to on-chip, and there are disadvantages uh, to on-chip also. Clearly, if you're on-chip, your latencies are much lower compared to off-chip interconnects. Off-chip interconnects are huge, and you have to go off-chip. So latency is a big difference. There are no pin constraints. So that's actually a big difference between on-chip interconnects and off-chip interconnects. You're not going off-chip. As a result, no pin constraints. So your routers can be much more complicated, uh, potentially. Uh, there are rich wiring resources compared to off-chip again. If you think about off-chip, you have real uh, big wires. But the, he, these are also real wires, but they're uh, you can even think of them as small, uh, yeah, nano wires, right? People are actually working on even smaller wires. So as a result, you have very high bandwidth on chip, and you may have simpler coordination because you're restricted to on chip, right? Of course, on chip has constraints and disadvantages. Uh, off chip, you don't have a two dimensional substrate, but on chip, you're limited by the two dimensional substrate, right? So you need to lay out uh, on this two dimensional substrate, and as a result, you're limited by uh, your wiring resources and your implementable topologies get limited. How many metal layers, for example, you have uh, limit uh, your implementable topologies. And energy and power consumption is a key concern on chip because you're limited. The limited power is true everywhere, but on chip you, you may actually have even more constraints because you have things that are consuming that power, like processing elements. So complex algorithms are usually undesirable because what you put over here is really uh, hardware-based algorithms. And uh, in hardware, you don't want complex algorithms in general. Uh, whereas if you have a router that's doing uh, software-based switching, the algorithms may not be uh, that hard to be uh, make complex. And also, you have logic area uh, that constrains the use of wiring resources. You're, you may have a lot of wiring resources, but uh, you don't want to have huge area uh, uh, in your router, for example. OK, so let's take a look at cost, channel characteristics, and workloads. If you look at cost on, uh, in off-chip, cost, cost of the network is dominated by channels, pins, connectors, and cables. Uh, whereas on chip, a lot of these are cheap, but storage and routers uh, are not that cheap. So basically, uh, your cost is really dominated by your buffering uh, and switches. Whereas if you look at off-chip, your cost is dominated by some other things uh, that are much bigger. Uh, so as a result, uh, uh, 
you, you have networks with many white channels and fewer buffers, and we want to get rid of even more buffers uh, on chip. So if you look at channel characteristics, on chip the distance is short, you get low latency, and you, have, uh, you, uh, you, you need repeaters every whatever uh, millimeters, uh, so, so that you can actually satisfy the clock rates uh, that are on chip. And you can also put logic in repeaters. And workloads, as we discussed, uh, on chip you have uh, multi-core cache traffic, but if you look at off-chip networks, it's more like supercomputer interconnect traffic, which could be very different from the traffic that you have in, uh, in a cache coherent multi-core system. Right? And if you think about the internet, actually it's a different type of traffic than even this one, right? It's very different. The characteristics that you have are very different from multi-core cache traffic. So it, it, it doesn't make sense to actually uh, design networks that are similar uh, on chip versus off chip. You really want to adapt to the characteristics of these different uh, constraints. And if you're interested more in this, we've actually written a paper uh, that was published in SIGCOM in 2012 uh, that talks about uh, on chip networks and off chip networks and their differences and looking at congestion and scalability in multi core interconnects. As far as I know, this is the only paper that was ever written in SIGCOM on, on chip networks. SIGCOM tends to be a very closed community in general. They don't like, they don't like different things <coughs> somehow. But it's, it's very interesting, I think, to think about the differences between uh, on-chip versus off-chip. Uh, because if, if, you, if you think about the history of how networks have evolved, uh, a lot of networks that went into on-chip, uh, at least a lot of networks that were designed in academia, uh, people were thinking, oh, let's do similar things that we've done off-chip. But it's not a good idea, I think, in general. Whenever you have constraints that change, you should really rethink how you do things. So I think this paper is an example of that rethinking. And I'll give you some more examples of that rethinking. And that starts with buffers, I think. <laughs> so if you think about off-chip, uh, buffering is maybe good, but we've discussed a lot of the downsides of buffering also. Uh, you need to manage the buffers. Uh, but buffers are actually good uh, because they're good for network throughput. So this is the load latency curve. And if you have, assume some sort of traffic, let's say uniform random, uh, if you have a lot of buffers in your network, the curve is to the right over here. Your saturation throughput is high. If you have a very small number of buffers, your, the curve is to the left over here. Your saturation throughput is low. And this makes sense because if you don't have enough buffers, you cannot keep injecting into the network, right? It's fundamentally, uh, it's a fundamental characteristic. You keep injecting into the network, but there's nowhere to inject to. So your network saturates. So uh, this is uh, what you get with buffers. So that's a big advantage of a lot of amount, uh, large amounts of buffering. Of course, it has other advantages. You can, you can handle congestion better, potentially. Uh, that's true, uh, but it's not depicted over here. It's depicted in the sense that it affects the average packet latency and saturation throughput. Uh, actually, the, the curve over here is not shown very well, I think. Uh, we didn't look at this part very well, but if you have small buffers, your packet latency may be lower, actually. So the curve actually may look like the small buffers uh, your minimum packet latency may be lower because you don't need to manage a large number of buffers, right? Okay, so this is the good part. Uh, but there is a bad part also because buffers consume significant energy and power. They consume dynamic energy when you read and write. And they assume st st consume static energy even when the buffers are not occupied. Right? This is uh, essentially uh, buffer. And, it, and uh, the technology you use to design buffers matters a lot. If you use an SRAM technology, then your static energy is lower. But if you use like register file technology, your static energy is even higher. Uh, so of course it depends. It's, it's not easy to use DRAM technology in these buffers because it's not very low latency, right? And buffers also add complexity and latency because you need to have logic for buffer management. And we've seen that. Uh, virtual channel allocation, credit-based flow control. And this actually complicates the network quite a bit. A lot of the complications that we've discussed is because of buffering. Uh, Certainly, routing itself has uh, a complication, but buffering adds a significant flow control. You actually need a back network to handle these credits, act next, or uh, on and off control, right? And also, they require significant chip area. Uh, there are a bunch of uh, prototypes that show that uh, the buffers occupy a significant fraction of the total on chip network area. 75% uh, is probably a very high number. Maybe these were not very optimized. Uh, and I know that they're not optimized because they didn't use SJAM buffers, for example, but still it's a, it's a large area as we will see in some other slides. So the key question that we may want to ask when you're actually moving from off-chip to on-chip, or even off-chip, I think, actually, 
uh, is can we get rid of buffers? This, is, this, may, this may sound very simple. Actually, this is really an old idea. In the 1960s, as I uh, said, hot potato routing was developed. And hot potato routing is you don't have buffers. You just pass on the hot potato to someone else. You don't care who you pass on to. You just want to, nobody wants to hold on to the hot potato because they will get burned, right? That's a good analogy. And people actually considered not having buffers on the internet for some time, and they quickly dismissed the idea. Why? They, because uh, they thought the curve uh, uh, would look like this for the internet. So if you actually have large buffers, you get significant throughput. And if people are actually loading the internet a lot, then you want large buffers. And also, there's software management of buffers in a lot of the internet routers. So you can manage them uh, more in a more flexible way. So the key question is, if, uh, is if, you're, if your network can tolerate uh, this difference between small buffers and large buffers, maybe you don't want a lot of buffers, right? OK. Yeah, basically, it's an old idea, but it's uh, surprisingly, actually, uh, a lot of works assume buffers without even questioning uh, that assumption for a long time. So we wanted to question that assumption. Uh, and the first thing uh, to ask is, OK, we have buffers. The curve looks like this. We have no buffers. The curve looks like this. We know that the curve will be different. But how much different? Right? How much throughput do we lose? And how is latency affected if we actually uh, go bufferless? And up to what injection rates can we use bufferless routing? And are there realistic scenarios uh, in which, in a network on chip, uh, you operate below those injection rates uh, that are reasonable for bufferless routing? So that's the idea. Of course, you can do these studies if you have a good simulator, if you have good workloads, you can do all of these studies, and that's what essentially we've done. Of course, on top of that, can we achieve energy reduction? If so, how much? Can we reduce area, complexity, etc.? And I believe all of these make sense uh, when you reduce the buffers. So it's in the paper. Uh, I have assigned the paper, but I'm not going to go through this one in detail. I'm going to talk about uh, it quickly and then discuss uh, some of the things that try to make it uh, real. So OK, but bless, uh, bufferless routing, uh, the key idea is to always forward all incoming flits to some output port, as we've discussed. If, uh, if no productive direction is available, you send it to another direction. Packet is deflected. And as I said, it's an old idea. Right? And you've already seen this animation a better way. So if you have bufferless, one, one packet can get deflected. If there, if there are two productive output ports that you can send both packets to, that's fine. You send both of them to the productive output ports. That's good. But if there is no productive output port for a packet, then there is a empty output port, you just send that packet. So uh, if you look at a modern router, it looks like this. And the buffers are over-provisioned in general. So basically, we want to get rid of that. And hopefully, that enables us to get rid of this. And hopefully, that enables us to get rid of that as much as possible. Right? That's the hope. The reality is going to be different. This paper is very optimistic in its assumptions. And then you move to the reality with the next work, as we will discuss. So basically, this paper introduces uh, an arbitration policy. Uh, that ranks the flits that are incoming uh, and does port prioritization. Uh, so the reason there is a ranking that happens uh, over flits is because uh, we want to ensure uh, live lock freedom. Right? If you're bufferless, you may actually have live lock in the network. Actually, you get rid of deadlock because deadlock doesn't happen anymore because you are not waiting for uh, buffering resources. Deadlock usually happens because you're waiting for a buffer and buffer is occupied by someone else. And you have the circular dependency on buffers. Once you get rid of buffers, that lock goes away. But you are left with live lock now. You need to ensure that each flit goes to its destination uh, in a bounded amount of time. Uh, so basically, the arbitration policy changes now. You have, uh, you, you create, it creates a ranking of uh, all incoming flits. And for a given flit in this ranking, it finds the best free output port. And it applies to this, applies this to each flip in the order of ranking. So now the question is, how do you rank the flips? And that becomes a hairy issue, actually, in the design. Uh, so each flip, in this case, is routed independently. It's called flitless. So we get rid of some of the benefits of uh, warm wormhole routing. The paper discusses warm bless, which is interesting. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that. Basically, how do you do wormhole routing in a bufferless network? Not so easy. Because you need to break the worms, actually, sometimes. Uh, because sometimes uh, you, 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 you cannot buffer anything, right? Uh, meaning that you cannot really buffer any part of the, sometimes the body flit needs to become the head flit, basically, in a worm. But you can read the paper for more detail of that. But if, you, if you're doing, assuming that you're doing the simple thing, simple thing is each flit is routed independently, uh, you need to ensure each flit gets to its destination. 
Uh, and how do you ensure that? So all this first arbitration is one way of doing that. Basically, uh, it, it guarantees that the oldest fleet injected into the network arrives to its destination because it's always prioritized because by this ranking scheme. That sounds good, right? Uh, and you do all this first ranking, and you assign the uh, highest ranked fleet to the productive port is possible. So hopefully the highest ranked fleet always gets the productive port, which is true in a router. Otherwise, you assign, uh, if the productive port is not available for the uh, flit with the given rank, you assign it to a non-productive port. And that's how the deflection algorithm works. We're going to get back to this and deconstruct this because this oldest force ranking is not actually easy. Actually, this, this arbitration may, is, becomes more complex than an existing virtual channel router. If you think about a virtual channel router, our arbitration is not that hard. Buffering is hard, flow control is hard, but arbitration is not that hard. You just look at the queues, heads, and then you pick one to go to uh, a particular output port. Yes? Do you ensure when you do like, the deflection of splits that mm -hmm. they arrive in order? Like, That's a great question. Package, and then you would hope that it arrives in order when all splits arrive. Yeah, that's a great question. So they don't, uh, so bufferless routing doesn't help you with in order. So it basically changes uh, the uh, potential order of arrival. But that's, we give up in order delivery, yes. But you can, you can reassemble the packet on the receiver side because you have uh, fleet IDs for a given packet. You know which ones you're missing. It's very similar to TCP, for example. Uh, you can reassemble. Essentially, this requires reassembly buffers, as we will see. So the buffering requirements in the, uh, in the receiver actually increases, but there is an easy way to fix that because you need to, usually what happens is in the receiver, uh, you're waiting for a cache block, let's say, in an on-chip network, 64 bytes. Uh, you normally wait for the entire cache block before you do something with it. You, so you, buffer, you have a buffering allocated for the entire cache block. Let's say it comes in eight flits. You wait for all of the eight flits to, after, before you do something with it. Does that make sense? Because you usually write uh, to, the, to your cache at the granularity of a cache block. So we're going to exploit a lot of on-chip advantages. But that's a very good point. Uh, uh, if you think about wormhole routing, it guarantees in-order delivery of the entire flit. And if you're rely uh, the, the entire packet, if you're relying on that for some reason, uh, that, uh, mm, that is broken here. But you can reassemble. And I think this is also a good question. Uh, do you really need that sort of in-order uh, delivery requirements? Personally, I don't think so. <laughs> I think you can, uh, you don't really need it because when, when do you really need it? Because you, you, uh, if most of your, if you want to do it for coherence reasons, uh, most of your coherence packets are only a single flit, usually. They're control packets and there is no breaking of the single flit in this case. So they arrive in whatever order they arrive. Uh, and most of your uh, larger packets that are broken into flits uh, that lead to this out of order delivery uh, are data packets. And in general, you don't really care about how you deliver the data, right? Actually, we, we break that even in uh, the memory systems, right? We do a critical word first uh, fetch from the memory system. So we try to fetch the critical word first. This, that may affect the delivery, but I think you can add priorities on top of this to say, oh, this is a critical word, so try to prioritize it. Okay. Okay, so the, uh, the question, uh, so uh, let's, let's back up a little bit. So where, where can we apply this to? Uh, so this can be applied to most topologies. Uh, basically, uh, your number of input ports, I don't know what happened here. Is it a comma? That thing is weird. <laughs> basically, your number of output ports should be greater than or equal to your number of input ports for this to work, right? <laughs> if your number of output ports is less, then you have a problem. Because then you need to buffer. Right, so I don't know what happened. Let me see if that's the case. Oh. Okay, it's the same, interesting. Anyway, we'll have to fix that. That's greater than or equal to. And every router should be reachable from every other router, of course, because you're routing, misrouting things uh, right now. Uh, flow control and injection policy. This is completely local now, flow control. There is no need for signaling an upstream or uh, upstream router that you have buffers because there are no buffers. And you inject into a router whenever an input port is free. Basically, uh, the, uh, whenever you're injecting, you need to look at uh, 
we discussed this with the crossbar earlier. You need to look at all of the input ports, and if an input port is free, then you can inject. There is no deadlock, as we've discussed. Every flit is always moving. That's good. And if you use all this first ranking, uh, there is no live lock also. Otherwise, you could run into live lock. Okay, so let's take a look at advantages and disadvantages of this sort of network. No buffers, uh, purely local flow control, simplicity, no credit flows, no virtual channels, simplified router design, hopefully, but we'll get back to that. No deadlocks, no live locks, assuming uh, uh, all this first. Adaptivity, actually, this is actually interesting. You get natural adaptivity because of this deflection, right? If you're in a congested area, packets just simply get deflected and they go around that congested area, hopefully. So that's good. Uh, the routing algorithm has built-in adaptivity. And router latency reduction, but we'll get back to that in a little bit. This paper is very optimistic in its assumptions. It's looking forward, but it's not thinking about implementation a lot. And you get a lot of area savings uh, because you reduce buffers. But there are disadvantages, of course. You increase the latency uh, now because deflection actually routes around, and that increases the packet latency, right? Uh, especially when you have congestion. Uh, so at, at high congestion levels, uh, this may not work really well. That's why we, if you have large buffers, your saturation throughput is higher. If you have small buffers, your saturation throughput is lower, right? So at high congestion, you have a problem, basically. Your latencies are high. Uh, your bandwidth is also, saturation throughput is low. Now, this is, goes back to the point that you make. You need to have buffering at the receiver right now to reassemble the packets that are uh, coming out of order in its flits. And if you're doing flit-based ba flit routing, you need to have header information at each flit. So there is some overhead that you add to the network uh, to carry that header, header information in each flit. If you look at wormhole routing, uh, buffered routing, only the header flit needs to carry the header information. All of the other flits can, don't need to carry the header information. Now there's also the interesting question there, uh, the, what fraction of your uh, packets are single flit packets and multi flit packets, right? Control packets are usually single flit packets, unless you have a really narrow network. Uh, usually they're not really narrow on chip. Uh, uh, because your, your control packet doesn't need to provide more information than let's say eight bytes, right? You can encode a lot of information in eight, eight bytes uh, or 32 bytes. But if your data packets are usually the ones that are longer. Okay, so all this first uh, arbitration is complex, as we've discussed, and we're going to discuss more, and quality of service also becomes more difficult, because you eliminate the buffer. One of the nice things about buffering is it helps you with quality of service, because it keeps the packets, so you can analyze them, and then you can decide, okay, I'm going to take it out of this virtual channel and take it out of that virtual channel. Now you need to do all of that quality of service while the packets are moving in the network, right? Uh, okay, there's also impact on energy. So router latency reduction, uh, let's take a look at uh, an evaluation over here. Uh, this is the bad news. Bad news is usually uh, uh, comes with uh, bad uh, patterns. Actually, there's a hotspot pattern that's analyzed in the paper that may be even worse, but hotspot is not good for, uh, in general, any network, so the curves look similar. Uh, so this is uniform random injection, and this injection rate in terms of flits per cycle per node. And as you see over here, this is the best baseline. It's, it has ample buffering. It's minimal adaptive routing. Uh, it doesn't do non-minimal adaptive routing because we don't want to solve the live lock issues over there. Uh, but minimal adaptive is doable. Uh, and as you can see, it's far beyond any other network over here. And these are the bufferless networks. They're all different versions of bufferless networks. One of them has one cycle latency, two cycle latency, flit-based routing, worm-based routing. Worm-based routing we didn't discuss. You can read the paper. And the paper is a required paper, so I would recommend reading it. So it doesn't look good, right? <laughs> Yeah, but if you actually look at real workloads, it looks much better because real workloads are actually not uniform random <laughs> and they don't inject this much. This is basically a lot of injection. This is almost 0.5 flits per cycle per node. Then the question is, what is reality? What is reality? Then you simulate with the real workloads and it turns out it's not, I'm, I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but basically bufferless and buffered networks have similar performance in terms of real workloads. Uh, and this is moderately intensive. Uh, we assume perfect caches in this case, perfect L2 caches, not perfect L1 caches. Because if you actually don't assume perfect caches, it turns out your network is even less loaded. And this is an observation that a lot of people made. There, there are these networks on chip. Usually they're not used. Usually they're not very loaded. Because you send the, uh, you, you miss in the cache, and then you have communication between the L1 caches and the distributed L2 cache, let's say. And then 
sometimes you hit in the L2 cache, you get the messages back. When you miss in the L2 cache, now you, or L3 cache, you go to memory controller, and that flits get decommissioned for a while because now it waits for the memory latency. Right? So it's out of the, out of the network uh, that's on chip. So that's why there's not a lot of load on this network. Not all applications actually insert, insert a lot of load. Some applications do, of course, and we will see that uh, in a little bit. So that's the, one of the key observations. There's not a lot of load on the on-chip network. As a result, you have very little performance degradation with uh, bufferless sharding. And this paper is very optimistic in its results. So we're going to look at more realistic results in a little bit. Yeah, OK. And look at, let's look at the energy over here. So you get significant energy improvements, as you can see over here. So this is the breakdown of buffer energy. Uh, so these are, uh, these are buffered networks. This DO, dimension order routing, min AD, minimally adaptive routing. And ROM is a version of Valiant's al algorithm, actually, uh, that does oblivious routing. Uh, so as you can see, routing matters relatively little in these networks. Uh, and if you have a lot of buffering, buffers consume a lot of energy. Link energy is like this, and there's a router energy also. Now, if you get rid of buffers, you essentially consume little energy. There's some little buffering that you still have over here. Uh, uh, link energy increases a little bit because now you're doing more deflections. And router energy also slightly increases because you're doing more deflections. You're exercising more routers uh, for a given, for an average packet. So that's the trade-off, basically. You get rid of almost all of your buffer energy, but you increase your link energy and router energy because deflections cause a packet to travel more uh, hops, more links, and more routers. But overall, the energy uh, looks reasonable. OK, so these are the key observations. Injection rates are not extremely high on average because the network is also sell. First of all, uh, L1 caches act as a filter, and the network is also self-throttling. You cannot. Uh, you cannot keep injecting into the network because at some point you run out of your uh, miss buffers, right? MSHRs. Essentially, for bursts and temporary hotspots, we're using network links as buffers. So the conclusions of this work is this, basically. Uh, for a wide range of application and network settings, buffers are not really needed in the network on chip. As a result, if you eliminate them, you get significant energy savings and significant area savings. Area savings is, uh, we will see better area results in a little bit. Uh, you get simplified, hopefully, router and network design. Certainly network design, but router design actually becomes more complex, and we're going to go into that. And performance slowdown, performance loss is actually minimal. If you're optimistic, it can even increase, because the optimism is that if you don't have buffers, you can actually make your router even faster. But we're going to see that that's not actually correct. So essentially, there's a strong case for rethinking network on chip design. Uh, and at the time we wrote the paper, we, su we suggested that future research should focus on bufferless networks and figuring out how to make them work uh, for different things. OK, and that's the paper. Any questions so far? OK. So maybe I'll take a break before I start the next one. But uh, Basically, what we're going to cover is some issues in bufferless deflection routing. Live lock is a key issue, and live lock is the one that causes the routing router to be complex. And we're going to think about different algorithms for live lock. This is something that people have not thought about. How do you actually guarantee live lock freedom with minimal complexity? And we're going to talk about that. And also, there are issues like, OK, not all workloads have these low loads. What if you have a lot of high injection rates into the network? How do you handle that? We're going to talk a little bit about that, but maybe not go into the full detail. There's a lot to be done over here, actually. And then on top of that, how do you actually provide quality of service and fairness? We're not going to talk about that within the context of bufferless networks, but there, there's a lot of interesting uh, ideas here also. So as, some, uh, as, uh, as one of you mentioned yesterday, quality of service and fairness is actually important in any type of network. OK, so let's take a break right now for 10 minutes. Uh, be back at 25 past. And then we'll continue. OK, so we've been talking about bufferless routing. And uh, let's talk about how to make it more implementable and real. And we're going to ta tackle complexity even more. Uh, so l let me pull back a little bit. I think uh, you can always design a system with a lot of over-provisioning, a lot of buffering. But you run into, uh, then you, you can handle congestion really, really well. Uh, and you can handle high load really well. That's great. But you, it comes at a cost. 
energy efficiency, especially, and complexity. Right? You can also have no buffers or something that's really simple over here. Your performance doesn't, uh, isn't very high, especially at high loads, but maybe you're simple. The question is, is that really simple? Right? That's, that's the question that we wanted to answer. And it's su surprisingly, there's a lot of work that covers this space, which is a lot of buffering, a lot of over-provisioning, making things more and more complex over time, handle yeah, better workloads, that's good. But there is very little work that we found on this side where, oh, this, there's no buffers. How do you actually handle the issues that arise when you don't have a lot of buffers? That's why we were actually the first ones to discover that the router actually becomes even more complex when you don't have buffers. And that was actually interesting because in the first paper, we assumed that router is actually going to become more simple. But it actually becomes more complex as we will discuss. OK, so we've already discussed this. Uh, we've already seen significant potential for bufferless routing, significant area reduction, minimal performance loss with real workloads, not with uh, intensive patterns. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there are unaddressed complexities in the router. It turns out this uh, uh, the complexity in the router leads to long critical path and large reassembly buffers, as we've discussed. So we're going to get rid of that now. Basically, we'd like to obtain the benefits as much as possible while simplifying the routers as much as possible in order to make bufferless network on chips uh, more practical. So what are the problems that a bufferless router must solve? First of all, it must provide live lock freedom, and we knew that very well. A packet should not be deflected forever. And it must reassemble packets upon arrival uh, because of this uh, reordering that we've discussed. So if you look at, uh, at a high level view, a bufferless router looks like this. It has deflection routing logic. It has a crossbar, and it has uh, reassembly buffers and, uh, after the ejection logic. So it doesn't look that bad, but it turns out this is not sim uh, simple. So the, the uh, live lock freedom should be handled somewhere over here, and the packet reassembly should be handled over here. It's not, pa packet reassembly is not that hard, actually, as we've discussed, right? Uh, 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 but you need buffers over there. And actually, the original paper discusses there's a trade-off. You get rid of buffering here, but you increase the buffering over here. The question is, do we really increase that buffering? As we will see, you could actually use the on-chip buffers. If you're, if, you're integrating, if you're integrating your network with the core, then you can actually use the uh, on-chip buffers. Uh, OK, uh, so first of all, how do we provide live lock freedom? You sort the packets by age, oldest first routing, and then assign uh, in age order to the output port. For each output port, you decide what is the oldest flit that wants that output port. That's the output, ar output port arbitration. It turns out this leads to significantly longer critical path uh, than a buffered router. Uh, if you think about a buffered router, you don't need to do, first of all, you don't need to do oldest first uh, routing at all because you don't need to handle the live lock freedom problem. So a lot of the on-chip buffered routers or off-chip buffered routers, what they did was they did round robin across the virtual channels. So round robin basically easily picks which virtual channel is going to be prioritized over the other one. So that's relatively easy. You don't need to sort anything by age. Uh, OK, so reassembling packets upon arrival. Uh, essentially, reassembly buffers must be sized for the worst case, as we will see in a little bit. And this could be very large per node. I don't think 4 kilobytes is that large, but as uh, network size increases, uh, this can become larger. So let's tackle these problems uh, in a little bit. Let's understand these problems a little bit more. Uh, because this uh, leads to algorithms, I think, the first one. How do you provide live lock freedom? Uh, it's essentially algorithms. Uh, the first question is, what stops a flit from deflecting forever? Right. You can timestamp all the flits. All the flits are assigned their desired ports. Of course, if, the, if two flits have the same timestamp, you need to have a tiebreaker. It could be the node number that's injecting it, for example. Uh, so essentially, this leads to a total ordering among the flits, right? And this total order, as long as it's obeyed by all of the routers, that's great. The oldest flit always has guaranteed progress, and at some point it gets out of the network, it becomes, uh, the next one becomes the oldest, so it's guaranteed progress, dot, dot, dot. If it hasn't reached its destination, basically. Some of them may reach their destination without being the oldest, right? Actually, most, most packets, most flits uh, do that. They don't become the oldest before they reach the destination. Depends on the congestion patterns in the network. Uh, so new traffic that's injected is clearly lowest priority uh, at that time. So what is the cost of this? So if you actually uh, try to design this router, uh, you need to have a sorting network, first of all. You need to figure out uh, the ordering of the flits by age. So it's a long latency sorting network. This is one example. You have three comparator stages for four flits over here. These are the four input ports. 
uh, and assume that uh, the highest priority is one. So you basically want to sort them. Uh, well, essentially that's the sorting network. In the end, you get one, two, three, four. And you can design this. Okay. You can run through the animation yourself and figure out what's happening basically. <laughs> okay. Sounds cool, right? <laughs> but basically, this is actually a router by itself also, if you think about it. It's really <laughs> a switch by itself. A switch that has some intelligence that makes a decision. Uh, yeah. Okay, anyway, I'm not going to go through this in detail now. Uh, so the, the downside is this is a long so, uh, so, uh, sorting network. That's, first of all, you sort it. Now you figured out which ones, uh, what is the ordering that you have over here. Now one, two, three, four, all the, uh, the highest priority is always here, the lowest priority is always here, right? Now you need to do something else on top of that, right? After sorting, you need to assign the flits to output ports in priority order. For each output port, uh, you need to essentially do the assignment. Uh, and uh, the port assignment of the younger flits now depends on that of the older flits. So there's a sequential dependence in the port allocator. So let's assume that you've ordered the flits based on age. This is the oldest one, this is the youngest one. The oldest one, Requ is requesting east and it's granted east. This is one way of thinking about it. Of course, there are multiple potential designs that you can do. Now, the, for the second one, uh, what's available is not east anymore. It's uh, north, south, and west are available. If the second one is requesting east, it will not be able to get it. And if it's only requesting east, it will be deflected. So, and then north is picked somehow. And then south and west become the only ones that are available to this one. This one is requesting south, that's good, it's granted. And west is the only port that becomes available for this one. And if it's requesting south, too bad, it's deflected. Right. So essentially, in this case, two flits are deflected. But the deflection decision is dependent on the previous allocation that you do. Because um, you, you have uh, availability of ports and you, you, want, you, can, you, can, you basically need to uh, send stuff to ports that they don't want to be sent to. Uh, in a bufferless network. So basically this is what the uh, mm, port allocation and sorting looks like. You have a priority sorting mechanism and they have a port allocator. And because of the sequential dependence and the long latency, you get significantly longer critical path. If it's 43%, it's actually optimized. It could be much longer than a buffered router. The question is, is there a cheaper way to uh, route while guaranteeing lilac freedom? And the answer is uh, yes. Uh, what is really, the, the first question is, what is really necessary for live lock freedom, right? Do you really need all of that total order across all of the packets that you see in the network? And the answer is no, you don't need that total order. So in this case, if you look at what we've done before is, all age-based priorities lead to total order. And there's no need for total order if you care about live lock freedom at low cost. Basically, all you need to guarantee is to pick one flit and prioritize it until it arrives to its destination and ensure any flit is eventually picked. Let's call that the golden flit. It's actually packet based. If you read the paper, you will see that, but let's assume flit based. Let's call that the golden flit. So you pick one flit to be golden and prioritize until it arrives and ensure that any, pa any flit is eventually picked. And that's the simplest live lock freedom mechanism that we could come up with. I'm not sure if there's anything simpler than this at this point. Of course, you can make it more complicated, as we will see in a little bit, to make things a little bit better. But this is all you need. So now the question is, how do you select the golden packet or golden flit? Uh, now, you can actually be simple here, because uh, uh, this is a distributed thing, right? You have actually many, many potential nodes that are uh, injecting into the network. Uh, and you want to actually ensure that any flit that's injected in the network at some point is guaranteed to become golden. That's the idea. So what's the simplest thing that can you do here? Uh, well, first of all, a given packet stays golden long enough to ensure arrival. That's the first thing. Meaning that, uh, assuming that you prioritize this flit in every single router, how long should you need to prioritize it for? And that's essentially the maximum no contention latency. Right? So for that period, you need to keep a pack, uh, flit golden because you're guaranteeing in the routing logic that golden flit is always going to be prioritized. That's good. And this is going to make the logic simple because you just have golden, not golden. That's the only difference. Okay. And how do, then the question is which one, which flit becomes the golden? 
So this answers the question when a flit becomes golden, when the golden flit changes. Uh, the, go the golden flit stays golden for the maximum no contention latency. That's the maximum uh, distance between source and destination and how long it takes. And also, uh, which, which flit do you, do, you pick, do you pick next to be golden? So in this case, we actually made it really simple. Uh, you basically look at all possible packet IDs that could be present in the network. And you rotate the selection in a deterministic manner, static manner, for simplicity. So you know exactly, in a non-chip network, again, you know uh, what could be in the network, right? So you basically, if you look at a packet, you have source, destination, and request ID. Uh, and every, uh, when you're injecting into the network, uh, essentially, uh, you, uh, you, you know the ID of the flit that you're injecting into the network. It has a source ID and it has a request ID. And that's unique. Basically for every source, when you're injecting, it needs to uh, keep track of the request ID because it needs to get a response or it needs to keep track of it for some other reason, right? That's what happens in a cache coherent network. Uh, um, you, you stamp it with the source ID and then you have a buffer uh, when you're injecting uh, that uh, tells the request ID. And that's unique across the entire network. What you can do now is you can start a deterministic rotation that basically says, I'm going to start with source zero, request zero, and I'm going to designate that as golden, that designate that slot as golden, and I'm going to do it for, let's say, maximum no contention latency cycles. From cycle zero to cycle 100, source zero's request zero will be golden. At cycle 100, I'm going to pick source one's request zero. At cycle 200, I'm going to pick source 2's request 0. At cycle 300, I'm going to pick source 3's request 0. At cycle 400, I'm going to pick source, one, source 0's request 1. Basically, you're really cycling through all possible requests that could be in the network. And you're prioritizing each of them for the maximum no contention latency. And every router is aware of this. Every router obeys this because they're designed that way. Does that make sense? Now the question is, of course, when you pick source zero's request zero to be golden, that may not be in the network. Because you're really going through a static schedule, even though a source may not be injecting anything into the network, you say, okay, this particular slot that could be in the network is golden. Doesn't matter, right? You basically wasted that golden slot. Nobody's in the network. That you, uh, the, the golden packet is really not in the network. That's fine, that slot is designated still as golden. But at some point, every slot has, uh, will eventually become golden. Does that make sense? So if a, if a packet is injected into the golden slot, it'll be delivered, basically. That's the idea. And if it doesn't get delivered, if, if there's a race condition, it gets injected in cycle, let's say, uh, for example, if source, source zero request one gets injected uh, in cycle 450, it has only 50 cycles to be delivered. It'll be golden for only 50 cycles. If it reaches its destination, that's fine. If it doesn't, yeah, maybe it will need to wait until its next turn to become golden, right? It's very simple. It has a bound in terms of latency and the latency bound is very long. It's basically, but the hope is that you don't rely on this live lock freedom guarantee very often. If you're relying on this live lock freedom guarantee, then you have some other problems in your, uh, with congestion in your network anyway. That's the idea. So this just is there to guarantee correctness in the end. So that's the other high level idea. Correctness uh, guarantee doesn't need to be uh, something extremely complicated if, it, if you don't need to exercise it very often. Okay, so I'm giving you the idea now. Basically, you cycle, uh, okay, at cycle 500, you go to source one, request one, 600, source two, request one, so 700, source three, request one, 800, source zero, request two. If you have four sources, that's what you do. And if you have, so let's, let's assume a realistic network. If you have, let's say, if you're able to inject 128 uh, flits into the network and you have 16 sources, then you have 16 times 128 slots that you cycle through. And you do that, and your worst case latency you can calculate based on that uh, if you have live lock issues. Okay, now we've figured out which packet becomes golden. Let's see how we can actually route that. Uh, 
basically you need to only properly route the golden flit. I'm switching between golden packet and golden flit, but they're really the same thing in the end. If you're doing flit based routing, it's the same thing. Uh, basically, that's, that simplifies the router quite a bit. Now you don't need priority sort because you don't, need, you don't have priorities, you just know which one's the golden flit. And you don't need sequential port allocation because we're going to be more liberal in what we do with, uh, with our ranking. And you can actually improve upon this as we will see later. So first let's route the golden fit in a two input router. We're going to build a permutation network that actually does this routing. So you basically, uh, the, the, the function of this two input router is, uh, in step one it picks a winning flit. And winning flit is, if, 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 if one of the flits is designated as golden, golden flit is the winning one. Otherwise you randomly pick one of the flits. You can do better than random if you want to minimize deflection, for example, but this work wants to be as simple as possible. And then it steers the winning flit to its desired output port and deflects the other flit. Well, not necessarily deflects, because it may not actually be deflected. The, the desired output port may be that one, right? Basically, only the winning flit gets its desired output port. The other one, we don't care. Well, there's no choice anyway, because it's two by two router. So a golden flit is essentially always routed towards its destination in this case. So let's take a look at uh, an example over here. So this is uh, a, a, a permutation network that's consisting of four two by two routers. Each block makes decisions independently in this case. So the router becomes actually simpler also. Uh, and deflection is now a distributed decision across these. So uh, let's pick one as golden over here. You have these, there are no priorities. This one is golden because it happens to be in a slot that's golden designated as golden. And we know that, every router knows that, so it has a bit set saying that, okay, at this point in time, this is golden. Uh, so let's take a look at how this one does the routing. There are no, there are no gold, uh, there's no golden flit over here. As a result, this one picks one of them to be, uh, mm, or, uh, this one picks one of the input flits randomly to be the winning flit. Let's assume that the red one wins. If the red one wins, the red one's destination is over here, and this uh, two by two uh, router knows that it needs to route this uh, to this output port. So it basically does a swapping decision. And the green one gets this output port, which in this case is a productive output port if you look at the uh, internal uh, permutation network. So the router itself is a network actually, if you can see over here. <laughs> But it's a simple network. So let's take a look at this one over here. Uh, remember this one's golden. So this particular uh, switch uh, says, oh, the, the winning flit is the golden one, so I'm going to prioritize it. So how will it prioritize it? It will basically give it its productive output port. The yellow one wants to go here. The blue one is sent over here. So far, it's okay because blue one can potentially go here. That's good. There's no uh, deflection yet. Well, deflection happens at the end anyway. Okay. So basically now this is what happens. And then in the second stage, let's take a look at what happens to this router. Uh, none of them is golden. As a result, you randomly pick one of them that wins. The green wins. And green wants to go here. That's good. It gets prioritized. And blue one happens to go to its output port also. That's good. So nothing is deflected over here. That's good. If you look over here, uh, yellow one is golden. And yellow one wins. It goes to its output port. And the red one gets deflected because it really wants this output port, but it has to go through this one. Make sense? So it's a very simple router that makes deflection a distributed decision. Of course, you can optimize it better because some of the decisions are made randomly right here. So now we've gotten rid of both of these and replaced it with something that looks like this. That's much simpler. Okay, so this is our permutation network based pipeline now. Uh, injection and injection in this work is handled in a different way. It's not sent into the router, so that makes life a little bit easier. But you can think of injection and injection also as another port over here, but if you handle it in a different way, it actually uh, makes life easier. And you can read the paper uh, for more detail over here. Okay, the next problem is packet reassembly. Uh, let's take a look at some other problems that are uh, caused by packet reassembly. So reassembly buffers need to be large, basically. In the worst case, every node sends a packet to one receiver. Uh, that's like the hotspot pattern, right? Uh, so you have all these nodes and sending nodes and one packet in flight per node uh, and the receiver requires ON space now. So why can't we make the reassembly buffer smaller, you may ask. 
So what happens if the reassembly buffer is too small? Let's take a look at that case. You have many senders, you have the network, and you have reassembly buffer that looks like this. You have two flit packets and two packets that could be reassembled in the end. Let's assume that senders are sending their packets, they're coming, they're arriving, and this one allocates one of the reassembly buffers. Now it's waiting for its match, which is the second flit in the green packet. And this one also gets allocated, receives, received by the reassembly buffer. Now the reassembly buffers are waiting basically for the blue packet uh, and the green packet, the, the second flits. Now let's see what happens in the network. Uh, the yellow one comes in, into the network. It arrives at the receiver. It cannot be ejected because the reassembly buffer is full, because there is no buffering space. So what does it do? It gets deflected, so it gets circling around the network. Now things start getting injected into the network. Many senders are injecting stuff, and it turns out none of them can get ejected because they are destined to here. At some point, network becomes full. The senders cannot inject, and this cannot eject because it's waiting for the blue one and the green one, and they have not been injected yet. As a result, you have a, uh, you have a deadlock. This is a protocol level deadlock. It's not really a buffer level deadlock because there are no buffers in the network, but you cannot eject uh, from the network because there is not enough buffering uh, in the destination. And you cannot inject the things that would release the buffers into the network because there, is not, there are not enough links in the network now. As a result, you have this deadlock. Right? Make sense? So forward progress is limited. And this is an example of a protocol level deadlock. Essentially, because you're not handling the protocol really well, you have a deadlock. Okay. So let's take a look at how we can eliminate this deadlock. It's not that hard to eliminate, actually. Uh, but uh, the, the solutions that you develop will, be, uh, will affect your efficiency and performance. So let's assume that what if uh, you want to ask permission from the receiver before you send a packet. Every sender does that. So the idea is you have some reassembly buffers, limited. Uh, the sender first needs to reserve the slot, get the acknowledgment, and then send the packet. This way you guarantee that there is a reassembly buffer allocated for you before you send the packet into the network. It's a very conservative, basically. So you basically ask the receiver, can I reserve a slot in your reassembly buffers? Receiver says, OK, I reserved it for you. Now you can send it. So acknowledgment. And then the sender can start sending packets. Of course, the flexion routing happens in the middle. Now, the downside here is it adds additional delay to every request, an additional round trip delay, actually. You need to send the request, and then you need to receive the acknowledgment before you can send the packet. Not a good idea. This actually is terrible in general, especially if your network is not loaded, especially if this is not a problem. Right? This is not a good common case design. OK, so the, uh, another way of uh, escaping deadlock is by dropping. So we're going to have to resort to dropping, unfortunately. Uh, so you, you cannot just purely have deflection, but you need to have some sort of dropping uh, on top of this. So sender is optimistic in this case. In the, in the previous case, sender was pessimistic. Now you want to have an optimistic sender. It assumes the buffer is free. If it doesn't, the receiver drops and knacks, or negative acknowledgment. It sends a negative acknowledgment to the sender. And then sender at some point retransmits. So let's take a look at this one. So the sender first sends. Uh, and uh, the receiver is going to drop a negative acknowledgment, and some other packet will complete. We're going to retransmit the packet. We're going to get an acknowledgment, and then sender the freeze, da freeze the data. So sender is going to send, but it's not going to be able to alloc deallocate its buffers. That's not a good idea anyway in general. If, uh, unless you have a completed request, don't deallocate your buffers. Uh, OK, the receiver says, I'm full, I'm dropping, and sends a negative acknowledgment back to the sender. And the sender now, at some point, retransmits and hopefully gets a buffer. In this case, it's got lucky because there was something free. But that may not happen. You could keep retransmitting, and you may actually get NAX. And then the receiver acts, and then the sender now can clear its data uh, because it doesn't need to transmit again over here. So that's, that's the idea over here. Now, there's a downside. Uh, there, the big upside here is, in the best case, there's no additional delay because you're optimistic in your transmission. But transmit buffering overhead uh, you have for all packets. You could actually deallocate some of them earlier, but we have that buffering overhead and potentially many retransmits. So you could actually, if your network is congested, congested you keep retransmitting. Of course, this depends on your threshold of when you decide to retransmit. There are thresholds that need to be optimized here. But this actually leads to more congestion in the network potentially. 
So not good. So the idea in this work is to do retransmitting only once. So basically, retransmit only when space becomes available. You're optimistic at first, unless you're proven wrong. So receiver drops the packet if it's full and notes which packet it drops. And when space frees up, receivers, receiver reserves the space so that retransmit is successful. So you only retransmit once. And then receiver not notifies the sender to retransmit. So let's take a look at this. Sender is optimistic initially. It sends its packets, uh, its flits directly to the receiver. Receiver drops. Receiver makes a note of which node's request it dropped. Node zero's request zero, it dropped. It basically uh, doesn't tell anything to the sender for some time until something becomes free. And once that thing becomes free, the receiver reserves that particular slot and tells the sender, now please send me this particular uh, request that you sent, but I happen to drop. And then the sender now can send that and the slot is reserved, so it doesn't need to retransmit again. That's the idea over here. So it gets the best of optimistic and pessimistic protocols, uh, except there's, of course, still trade-offs. It's somewhere in the middle. But at least it doesn't have the delay initially, and it doesn't have uh, a lot of retransmits. OK, so that's one example protocol that you need to uh, handle. Uh, so basically, in the end, you cannot get rid of buffering, <laughs> because you have to put these packets somewhere. The question is, where do you do the buffering? And here, the buffering is actually only in the edge nodes, senders and receivers. Internally, the network doesn't have buffers, except for pipeline latches, of course. OK, so can we actually eliminate the buffers even more? And the next realization is that, actually, these buffers already exist. <laughs> so what are those buffers? You have uh, misstatus handling registers. Basically, whenever a node sends a request, it keeps a record of that. And we've seen it before. Misstatus handling reg re registers is an example of it. You have a list of outstanding cache misses. And this essentially has a lot of information, the data buffer. And you can essentially have, we have reassembly buffering for free. You can, you basically, whenever you receive a, a part of a flit, you place it into part of the data buffer that you already have for outstanding cache misses. So you actually don't need this additional reassembly buffering. Of course, if you're separated from the MSHRs, uh, if, you, if you have a completely different separate network interface, then you can do additional buffering over there. But there's no need in an on-chip network. You can actually use the MSHRs as your reassembly buffers. So that's the idea over here. So basically, we got rid of these reassembly buffers. They're really your MIS buffers, MSHRs. And we've already gotten rid of this part. OK, so basically, this is the idea in the end. Uh, this is the baseline buffer, this deflection router that we started with. It had large reassembly buffers, and it had this deflection routing logic. We got rid of the uh, deflection routing logic, which had, which had long critical path, uh, because it needed to sort it uh, by age, and it needed to allocate ports sequentially. We used the golden packet and permutation network ideas to replace it. Uh, oh, it's a different deflection routing logic right now, but it's not shown there. And then we got rid of the large buffers for the worst case with the idea of retransmit once and using cache miss buffers as the reassembly buffers. And then uh, your router looks like this. So it's a much simpler router right now. So the question is, much sim uh, what is much simpler? And what kind of performance do you get out of this much simpler router? OK, so there's some evaluation methodology. You can take a look at it. It's in the paper. Uh, and there's buffered baselines and bufferless baselines. Bufferless baselines bless in this case. Uh, and there are a bunch of workloads, multi-program, multi-threaded. We can take a look at this. And there's methodology for hardware modeling also. Of course, you need to model the hardware uh, routers. It's a very log models uh, uh, for uh, various routers over here and power. OK, so let's take a look at performance first. Uh, what is the performance degradation that you have going from an aggressive buffered network to bless to chipper? And if you look at the performance degradation, chipper is worse than Bless, actually. Bless has optimistic assumptions, as we will see. This doesn't take into account uh, uh, the router latency increase because of Bless. Uh, that's OK. But if you look at it, uh, there are some workloads. Uh, on, on average, the performance loss in multi-program workloads is about 13%. Uh, and in multi-thread workloads, it's even lower. So it doesn't matter almost over here. But the workloads that do not exercise network a lot your, the performance loss is relatively small. It's about 3.6%. And these are much more realistic results than the previous work. The workloads that exercise network a lot, very, very high congestion levels, 
you actually lose a lot of performance. It's about 50%. Now you could argue that these may not be extremely realistic workloads because this is a stream met workload, for example. Almost every access the cache miss, and as a result, you're really exercising the work the network. And we actually have perfect L2 caches, so we, we don't have anywhere to escape. So this is really stressing the network. This is one of the worst case evaluations. So I don't think this is actually very, very realistic, but if you, if you want to evaluate uh, to the extreme, this is the extreme evaluation, I think. So, uh, yeah, I don't think many people run these workloads in general. Although there are a few cases that uh, they exist. So most of the workloads are, I think, in this domain uh, over here. Okay, and multi-threaded workloads, these are workloads that are multi-threaded. Uh, so they don't exercise network a lot, as we expected. So you, you get minimal loss for low to medium intensity workloads. So let's take a look at power reduction. This is power, uh, buffered, bless, and chipper. Chipper is actually much more power, power efficient than, than bless because router power is reduced compared to BLESS. So the power reduction is about 55%. Even on workloads where uh, you lose performance a lot. So you basically get a lot of power reduction. So this is very good for power in general. And that's true even more for multi-threaded workloads because these workloads don't really exercise the network, but you have a lot of buffers that are just wasting power in the network. And watch the scale over here. This is much higher scale than this one because uh, this is the network power over here. And if, this ex if these workloads are not exercising network, their network power is inherently lower, right? Okay, so you basically get the majority of the power savings from removing buffers, and you can read the paper uh, for more detailed breakdown. And you get slight savings from blessed to shipper because the router is much, uh, uh, less complex right now. Let's look at the router area and critical path. So all of those optimizations that we've discussed, how does that affect? So if you look at the router area, you get significant reduction compared to a buffered router, about 36% which is similar to BLESS. BLESS also gets rid of a lot of the buffers, but we, uh, this is a little bit more because the, router also, the routing logic is also less complex. If you look at the critical path, uh, BLESS is not so good, but uh, we've done all of this to reduce the critical path actually. So the critical path is pretty much on par with a buffered router after, at this point. So you don't lose uh, the critical path or frequency uh, in, in any way. Okay. Okay, so I've given you the ideas. I think uh, I don't need to go through this. Uh, maybe I'll will, actually. So there are two key issues in bufferless deflection routing, very fundamental, live lock freedom and pushing of the buffers to uh, the edge nodes, packet reassembly. Uh, and bufferless deflection routers previously, as we discussed, were high complexity and impractical because of all this first prioritization. And they didn't have end-to-end -end flow control for reassembly. As a result, they were actually prone to deadlock also. It's not just uh, high complexity, but it, they were also impractical because uh, you need to solve this uh, deadlock issue with limited number of uh, reassembly buffers. So this idea of chipper is essentially a more practical deflection router. Uh, it gives you golden packet prioritization to enable short critical path. This retransmit once protocol enables deadlock free packet reassembly and cache miss buffers act as reassembly buffers. As a result, you actually don't need to have additional buffering uh, on the edge nodes. And as you see, the frequency of the router is comparable to uh, buffered routers at much lower power and area cost. And minimal performance loss at, at workloads that have low to medium intensity on the network. Any questions? Okay, so you can read the paper. It's not a required paper, but if you want to really look at, at uh, a real bufferless router, I would suggest looking at this one. Then the question is, okay, are we done? <laughs> Uh, we're, we're not done, uh, and I think actually this direction has a lot more potential going forward, uh, especially in SOC system on chips, where you, have, you don't have a whole lot of traffic on the network, but you do need a network that connects all of the components, and you do need to be extremely power efficient. I don't think it's a, it's a wise thing to do to actually spend a lot of your energy on buffering. So I think it's good to actually look into how to make this even more practical going forward, and that's the next work over here. Uh, actually, I will go into this in a little bit more detail because this is fun. <laughs> so basically, we're going to introduce a little bit buffering. <laughs> so if you look at the spectrum of bu no buffering and lots of buffering, you don't want to be at lo lots of buffering. I think we know that very well. Do you want to be at no buffering? You don't want to be over there also. <laughs> so you want to add some minimal amount of buffering because of high load situations. When you have high congestion, you really need some buffering. I mean, this is very fundamental, that's true, but how much amount of buffering is going to be the interesting question going forward. Basically, 
The problem is when you have high load, high deflection rate it hurts. And you get high deflection rates when you have high load. And uh, the idea of minimal defle uh, buffer deflection router is to add a side buffer to hold only flits that would have been deflected. I'm going to give you an example. There are also other issues that happen because of too much deflection. Uh, like when, when you actually have stuff circling around the network, you really want to suck them out quickly. <laughs> Meaning that uh, whenever, you, whenever uh, a, a request, uh, a flit arrives at the destination, you don't want to deflect that because of whatever reason. If two flits arrive at the destination at the same time, for example, and that's the same destination, if you have only one ejection port, you would deflect one of them. Not a good idea. Have just one more ejection port that's worthwhile so that you can suck the uh, flits out of the network very quickly so that, so that you don't cause deflections in the network. Because it's very costly for that flit to get deflected because if it gets deflected, it's going to go around and come back at some point. Maybe it'll get deflected even more if, if, the, if the flit is routed very close to its destination, it's at its destination, try to get it out of the network very quickly. That's the idea over here. And then uh, there's, uh, it's actually not enough to have just golden packet prioritization. It's also better to have some two-level prioritization. That's the idea over here. So this leads to significant power reduction and reduced area. And also, uh, compared to bufferless routers, it gives you better performance and closed half of the performance gap. So basically now the performance gap between buffered and bufferless, or minimally buffered, is much smaller. And I, we will actually see this. I think I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more. Uh, okay. Let me see. I don't know where the slides are. Where are they? Okay, I don't know what this is. So let's actually talk about this a little bit more, and then I'm going to reorder the slides. Because I think this is fun. I thought I reordered the slides, but maybe uh, maybe this thing didn't want me to order the slides. <laughs> PowerPoint has a mind of its own. Okay, we already saw this. Uh, well, we didn't see the slide, but basically, yeah, buffer starting is good. So the goal is to improve high load performance at low cost uh, of uh, low cost deflection networks by reducing the deflection rate. How do you do that? So I'm going to give you a couple, uh, several ideas. I've given you the high level ideas, but let's take a look at that quickly. So I'm going to skip this one. We already talked about chipper. Now we actually want to address the performance issue. So we, we address the correctness issues, live lock, deadlock, which actually lead to performance problems. But now we're going to tackle the performance issue, which is performance degradations that you have at high load. If you really want uh, a solution like this to be widely applicable, you really want to handle the high load problem. So uh, basically, what are the key performance issues? So there's link contention that you have. There's, there are no buffers to hold traffic. And any link contention causes a deflection. Not so good. There's also this ejection bottleneck that I mentioned. Only one flit can be ejected per router per cycle. And simultaneous arrival at the destination of multiple flits causes deflection. And this deflection is really not nice. And then there's also deflection arbitration. If you actually have fast arbitration, they deflect unnecessarily, as we will see. So we're going to sol uh, have three ideas to solve the problem. Basically, to handle the link contention problem, we're going to use side buffers. So we're going to add a little bit of buffering into the router, but we're not going to put it on the critical path. Basically, the buffering is going to happen only for deflected flits. So that's a very different kind of buffering than normally you have in routers. And we're going to eject up to some number of flits per cycle. In this case, it's two, because two happens to be a good number. Uh, and there's a new priority scheme that adds uh, a little bit more into complexity into the router, like a silver level, so that you can actually prioritize uh, uh, some flits over others, such, such that you reduce the deflections. Let's take a look at these over here. So link contention, uh, buffering a flit can avoid deflection on contention. But input buffers are expensive. We don't want to go into input buffers. Basically, we don't want to, flit, uh, we don't want to buffer all flits on every hop. That's a lot of energy. And large buffers are unnecessary because they cause uh, high static energy and large area. So the key idea is to add a small buffer to a bufferless deflection router to buffer only flits that would have been deflected. And then make them be part of arbitration in the next cycle. So if you go back to the baseline router that we've discussed, this is a chipper router. You have injection, ejection, and then this permutation network. Uh, okay, this far somehow gets deflected because this one happens to be prioritized. It happens. Now, instead of deflecting it, we're going to put it into a side buffer. That's the idea over here. So this normally gets deflected in the baseline, 
but we're going to put it into a side buffer here. And the side buffer will be uh, another level of injection. So you can see that the router complexity increases because we're injecting in, uh, from the side buffer also, and that gets prioritized over the injection port of the, uh, mm, of the, uh, of the edge node over here. And we also need some mechanism to actually put stuff, pull stuff out of the router and put it back into the, into the side buffer. So let's take a look at what happens. This gets deflected. This goes to this destination. That's good. And instead of deflecting it, you remove up to some number of flits per cycle from the outputs. In this case, it's one. And then that one deflected flit goes into the buffer, into that side buffer, essentially. And then it takes part uh, in arbitration in the next cycle. You re-inject this flit into the pipeline when a slot is available. What does that slot being available mean? When, uh, when an input port is actually uh, available, just like the original injection policy that we have with bufferless routers. Makes sense, right? So now you realize the difference between this buffer and the buffers over here. This is a much simpler to manage buffer. There is no need for credits over here, for example. It's very local. It's completely local. Nobody else needs to know about it other than this router. Okay, and then it, it gets injected. Hopefully in the next cycle, if it's lucky, it goes to its destination. If it gets deflected again, it may go back into the side buffer. Okay. So you, this could be also called the loopback buffer. Basically, you're looping back into the uh, injection port. Uh, okay, so you, you buffer some flits and deflect other slit, flits at a per, per flit level. Relative to bufferless routers, deflection rate reduces significantly. Uh, there's no need to deflect all contained flits. So if you look at a four flit buffer, it reduces the deflection rate by 39%. So it's significant. And can read, you can look at the deflection rate analysis in the paper. Relative to buffer routers, the buffer is much more efficiently used because you don't need to buffer all flits, you're buffering only when it's necessary to buffer. So you get similar performance with uh, a fraction of the buffer space and a lot, more, uh, a lot less complexity because managing this buffer is easy. It's local, completely local. So let's take a look at the ejection bottleneck. I've already given you the idea over here. But basically, flits deflect unnecessarily because only one flit can be ejected per router per cycle. It turns out in 20% of all ejections, more than 20, the two flits could have been ejected. All but one flit must deflect and try again. And these deflected flits go around the network and cause additional contention, even though they just arrived at the destination. Uh, so actually, if you uh, reduce the ejection width, uh, in increase the ejection width to two flits per cycle, you can reduce the deflection rate significantly. And you can see the analysis in the paper. Uh, so the key idea is to reduce deflections due to the single flit ejection port by allowing two flits to eject per cycle. So this is single flit ejection. You have an ejection over here and you're limited. Even though this came to its destination, this poor guy, now it gets deflected. If you have a side buffer, it gets into the side buffer. That's the good part. The, these things uh, interact nicely. But now it, it'll get ejected later at some point. But if you have two ejection ports, you can eject them quickly. That's the idea. Okay, so of course the question is, what if you have this in the baseline buffered routers, right? If you have this dual with ejection in the baseline, what does it help? Actually, it doesn't help much. There's no reason to have this two with ejection buffered routers because buffered routers don't run into this problem because they don't deflect, right? They buffer things. As a result, uh, the help that you get from this is much higher in a bufferless network or in a deflection-based network. Okay, the last one is uh, improving deflection arbitration. Basically, sometimes you incur uh, unnecessary deflections because you use simple priority schemes in the router. And the router may not be uh, uh, making the right decision. So you can have age-based priorities. That's good. You get full priority order, at least to the fewest deflections, actually. But it requires slow arbiters, as we've seen before. So if you actually use golden stage and two-stage permutation network, like we've discussed, uh, you, uh, it's fast. And it ensures forward progress. But it basically does this. It prioritizes one packet globally to ensure forward progress, but arbitrates among other flits randomly. Random is good for a fast critical path, but random common case leads to uncoordinated arbitration. Now, what does this mean? Basically, uh, okay, we've discussed this already, but basically you pick a winning flit. If it's uh, golden, you pick the golden one. Otherwise, you pick a random one. And that random one is not necessarily good. Uh, choice. And then you steer the winning flit to its desired output and deflect the other flit. So highest priority flit always routes to destination. So because each block makes decision independently, uh, you get a distributed decision. 
So, which means that these are not coordinated with each other. If you prioritize one flit randomly over here, that doesn't mean that you're going to prioritize it randomly over here. And that is not nice. Because you prioritize it, hopefully it's getting close to its destination, port, productive port. But this router makes the decision, oh, I'm not going to pick that randomly. I'm going to pick someone else. So your deflection rate can increase significantly. So you really need coordination, which means that you need to have some level of priority when you go into the router. OK, so that's the idea. I already say, said this. Like, no flit is golden. Assume that. All flits have equal priority because of that. And so a red flit wins that first stage over here. It's, it's trying to go to its destination. This one loses. Green flit loses at the first stage. It must be deflected now. So you know actually this one is, has lost. It's really being deflected. And it doesn't matter. Ignore the blue and yellow ones for now. So you basically get an unnecessary deflection because even though red one was prioritized over here and it's, uh, it was routed toward its destination, it got deprioritized over here because the decision was random uh, uh, and local to this uh, two input arbiter. So basically, both of these get deflected, and the red one's deflection was unnecessary, really. OK, so we're going to fix this problem by, uh, by being more coordinated. So the idea is very simple. You add another priority level and prioritize one flit to ensure at least one flit is not deflected in each cycle. Right? You could actually expand this to bronze flit, and, and you can do that more, right? You could add a little bit more priority into the system. Uh, so, okay, highest priority, one golden packet in the network. Uh, we've discussed this, it ensures correctness. The next highest priority is one flit the silver pit per router per cycle. So, it's a very local priority. Uh, it's chosen pseudo randomly and local to one router, and it enhances performance. So, basically, we randomly pick a silver flit. Uh, so, if you look at the flits over here, they all have equal priority. None of them is golden. And at the beginning, you randomly pick uh, the red flit as silver. And red flit wins at first stage. That's good. Green flit is deflected at the first stage. Now red flit it wins at the second stage also, so it doesn't get deflected. That's the idea over here. So you basically consistently prioritize the red flit within the router, as opposed to doing uncoordinated decisions across the routers of the switches of the permutation network. Now, if you look at this, this is within a router, right? You can say, OK, I, want to ex I can expand this to the larger network. And you're right. So the same thing happens across routers in a network. If the routers in a network are not coordinated, you could have these decisions. You may prioritize one flit, and then the next router may deprioritize that. As a result, it gets prioritized here. It gets deflected here. It gets prioritized, deflected, prioritized, deflected. So it's not a good choice in general. In general, it's good to have some coordination in the network. We didn't have that here. but some other work that we may get to talks about coordinating the routers. So that's one thing to keep in mind when you're designing networks. If you're making local decisions, that's not necessarily good for global thing. And this is one perfect example. Because if you look at a router, it looks like a network also. It's essentially doing the network at the higher level looks like a combination of these. And you may want to do the same thing at the higher level also. Especially, this is especially true when you're looking at applications. Let's say you, you, you have packets from multiple applications. You prioritized them in one router, prioritize application A in one router. You want to keep prioritizing application A in all of the routers such that its packets get delivered, right? You don't want to increase interference in the system. So coordinating across the router is actually useful uh, to ensure that applications satisfy their requirements also, not just at the packet level. OK, so I digressed a little bit. But this, this is an example of coordination across switches, across routers. You don't want to have fully local decisions. You don't want to have also fully global decisions, because that's hard to coordinate. You really want to have some coordinated decisions. OK, uh, so now you have a coordinated decision. We fix the link contention problem by using a, a side buffer. We fix the ejection bottleneck problem by using dual with ejection. and. We uh, fix the unnecessary deflection problem using two-level priority scheme. It's really the silver priority scheme. You could actually expand it, as we discussed. All of these came at the cost of a little bit more complexity. Now we added some buffers, but it's not the same type of buffers. We added some more ejection ports, and we added some more prioritization mechanisms. So it comes at a cost. But performance comes at a cost. The question is, how much cost are you going to pay, and how much benefit you're going to get, right? So let's take a look at the results. This is, again, 
some workloads. You can read the paper for more detail. Uh, and these are some of the different routers that we examined. Some of them are large buffered, typical buffered, and smallest deadlock free router. Uh, and uh, we actually sweeped a lot of buffer sizes here. And bufferless diffraction router is chipper. And we also compared some other prior work that proposed uh, what is it called? Adaptive flow control. It was published in 2010. It basically, the idea is you have input buffers as well as deflection routing logic, and they basically do coarse grained mode switching. When the network is not loaded, they move into deflection routing. When the network is loaded, they use buffers. So it's good for best of both worlds, but you need to have extra logic for to handle everything, meaning that you still have buffers, input buffers. So it's not, it's not that simple. And these are some common parameters you can read uh, in the paper. And okay, so let's take a look at the deflection rates and uh, input performance over here. So this is uh, weighted speed up across all average across all workloads baseline. If you add a side buffer, uh, you actually uh, yeah. I'm not going to go through this in detail. You can read the paper, but basically you reduce the deflection rate if you add a side buffer, but your performance also reduces. Uh, um, uh, all mechanisms individually reduce deflections, as you can see over here. Uh, side buffer alone is not sufficient for performance because the ejection bottleneck actually remains. Uh, and if you actually start combining these mechanisms, you get much higher reductions in, both in deflection rates. So only 10% 10 10 of the flits get deflected over here, whereas in the baseline, we had about 28% 20 of the flits that are deflected. So overall, you get significant performance improvement uh, over the baseline. Uh, by reducing deflections uh, by a significant amount. So that's the 5.8% performance improvement. So this is compared to a, a, a deflection router, of course, right? It's not, a, it's not compared to a buffered router. Okay, so these are the overall performance results. If you look at the buffered routers, they're all over here. This is average. Uh, if you look at chipper, it's over here. If you look at this adaptive flow control, it's basically bufferless and buffered combination. You switch based on the load in the network. So that's actually better than any of the bufferless ones over here, but MinBD actually gets very close to that. Uh, this minimally buffered deflection router actually gets better than some of the buffered routers over here, lightly buffered routers, let's say. And of course, the same trends remain. At high loads, it's not as good, but it's not as bad also. At high loads, chipper is very bad, as you can see over here. It loses significant performance, but uh, MinBD is much better. Okay, let's see if this is going to move. Okay, so basically that's the performance improvement over chipper. Uh, and it gets within 2.7% of the buffered router, which is not bad. So it basically closes the gap between bufferless and buffered routers. Okay, let's, uh, yeah, this is what I was trying to get to. That, that this is the breakdown, as you can see. You get, uh, you see that uh, the, this MIMBD adds some more buffering power, uh, but it's not a lot of buffering power. Uh, uh, and it, it significantly reduces the link power, uh, as you can see, compared to chipper because it reduces the deflections. So it's actually more power efficient uh, compared to uh, chipper as well. It's more power efficient compared to all of the buffered routers as well. Right? And this, if you look at this buffered plus bufferless together, if you implement both, you're not power efficient. It's very similar to the buffered router, except for some cases where you can prevent uh, uh, the use of buffers. Okay. So you can see that the buffer uh, power is very low over here. But as you keep adding buffers, our buffer power increases, of course. Right. Okay. So let's see. Uh, uh, there's more analysis you can read in the paper. So dynamic power increases with deflection routing, of course, right? That's another way of looking at these power results, dynamic versus static. Clearly, the deflection routing increases the dynamic power, but dynamic power reduces when you actually add the side buffer and uh, reduce the deflection rates. I'm trying to get to one slide. Okay, this is, this is a slide that's, re that's the really interesting, I think. Basically, this looks at network power on the x-axis and performance on the y-axis, and looks at the buffering space. So these are different buffered routers. The paper may have a better uh, view of this. Uh, this is chipper, the uh, green one over here. This is AFC, and ideally you would like to be in the Pareto curve over here, right? Uh, and MIMBD is actually over here, which is good. Uh, so its uh, network power is low, and its performance is high. If you want more higher performance, essentially 
you need to pay more. You need to pay net more network power. So this may be a good Pareto uh, optimal operating space, but uh, for, for relatively little performance improvement. I'm going to go here because it's not working really well right now. Okay, so basically if you want to look at the most energy efficient network, it turns out this minimal buffering leads to the most energy efficient uh, router design. So let's take a look at the area and critical path very quickly also. This is the area. So min BD doesn't add much compared to chipper. Very little area increase uh, over chipper. And you still reduce the area significantly compared to buffered networks as expected, right? So the trade-off is you add just a little bit of buffering to get high, much higher performance but this doesn't affect your area savings significantly because your buffer is really small and you don't have all of the logic associated with uh, managing those non-local buffers. Okay, and that's 36% compared to this sort of buffering. If you want to really over-provision your buffers, actually it's a, you get a lot more. And this is the normalized critical path. So the critical path of MBD is actually slightly higher than Chipper. I think it can be optimized even better. Maybe we didn't optimize it really well, 7%. So it's, it's within the optimization range, basically. Okay. Okay, so I think I've already given a lot of the conclusions over here. Uh, and this is actually interesting because this pushes uh, the bufferless networks toward buffering a little bit. And I think this is really the right way to go. Then the key question is now how do you close the gap between this one uh, and buffered networks? And that's where you need to handle the congestion really well. And that's what we should talk about probably after uh, we take a break for 10 minutes. Sound good? Let's be back at 35. I think I'm going to finish the bufferless routing path very soon. Uh, but I think this is a very good exercise actually to see the trade-offs uh, in, in an example space. Uh, even the buffering choice affects a lot of things, as you can see, in the network. And I don't think we found the best place in the buffering space uh, as to how to design a network. Uh, okay. So th then the next question is, how do you actually handle uh, high load in a network? Let's assume that you, you have the minimally buffered deflection routing. Actually, part of the high load problem comes from congestion control. Uh, and we have not uh, talked about as much except for source throttling. And the next idea is essentially to apply source throttling to uh, the networks. Now the network, usually bufferless networks actually, uh, at some point I, I, I told you that if you have the load latency curve, you don't want to be operating at your saturation throughput. You want to actually be operating much earlier. You want to stop uh, injecting much earlier. So controlling source throttling is really important as a result of that. So this very quickly, uh, this is the idea of having uh, source throttling in a network. And how do you do the source throttling is important, of course. Uh, it turns out, again, uh, if you look at uh, a lot of works, they don't care about applications. But you do want to care about applications when you're running real applications. It turns out you want to make source throttling more application aware, basically. And that's the idea in this work. I'm going to very quickly go over it in one slide. As you know very well by now, some applications are more sensitive to network latency than others. It's very similar to memory latency, right? Some applications are latency sensitive in general, some applications are more bandwidth sensitive, some applications are not sensitive at all. So this means that if you really want to throttle uh, the load injected into the network, you don't want to be insensitive to the application sensitivities. Meaning that applications should be throttled differently to achieve peak performance and energy efficiency in a network. You basically want to prioritize those applications that are more latency sensitive. You want to uh, reduce the priority of the applications that are less sensitive. And this paper proposed a mechanism to do that uh, in an intelligent way. Uh, the idea is to have application-aware source throttling, but do it in a heterogeneous manner uh, by respecting uh, the different characteristics of different applications. And uh, how do you, of course this has all the issues that we discussed with source throttling before. Remember source throttling had issues whom to throttle, when to throttle, by how much to throttle. Whom to throttle maybe determined based on application characteristics. This paper has a mechanism for that. I'm not going to go into the detail. When to throttle is determined based on how much load is injected in the network. You can, for example, look at the deflection rates in, in a region and throttle that region. And how, by how much to throttle is always difficult. <laughs> by how much to throttle is actually one of the most difficult decisions. How much do you stop injecting a node, uh, stop a node from injecting into the network? How long, how many packets, how do you do that? 
it's always uh, a lot of thresholds as we've discussed when we discussed fairness via source throttling, right? That's the idea. And this paper has some mechanisms to do that, but whenever you do source throttling, you need to solve those problems and it's not easy. But it turns out if you do that, you can improve performance and energy efficiency uh, significantly and you can bridge the gap a little bit more between bufferless and buffered networks. Can you get exactly the same as buffered networks? I don't think it's going to be possible because buffered networks fundamentally have higher uh, bandwidth, right? Higher saturation throughput. So by throttling it, you're reducing the inefficiencies that you cause because of deflections, but you're not fundamentally increasing your uh, saturation throughput, right? Throttling just ensures that you're operating at a nice point such that you don't oversubscribe your network. It doesn't fundamentally increase your saturation throughput. Make sense? And that's uh, one idea. Again, I, d I don't go into detail. If you're interested, you can read this paper in more detail. So there's a lot to be talked about bufferless uh, networks, actually. Uh, we didn't even talk about uh, application of this to different topologies, but uh, deflection routing is a very general idea. It's actually a very good idea in rings, for example, if you have hierarchical rings that we discussed yesterday. It makes a lot of sense to do deflection routing in rings, especially if you have small rings and uh, hierarchy of small rings. Deflection doesn't cost that much. You basically circle around the small ring again, and then hopefully you get to your destination ring. Uh, uh, hopefully the next time you try, you don't, you're, not, you're not deflected, right? So rings have less links. Uh, in that sense, there's a downside, but uh, uh, they also have less cost in deflection as well. And also it's very low cost. So if you want low cost, having hierarchical rings with deflection is a good idea. And this paper shows that if you have hierarchical rings with deflection, you can actually be much higher performance and more energy efficient than a, a buffered mesh design. Because as we discussed yesterday with hierarchical rings, your latencies could be much lower in a hierarchy of rings. So this is another thing that should be uh, examined going forward. Actually, a lot of uh, systems today are based on rings and hierarchical rings as well. And looking at buffering choice is important. Yeah, and this is another paper that goes into a lot more detail uh, on this topic if you're interested in this. Okay, and that's an older one. Okay, so I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you can do more readings. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about packet scheduling. Uh, we'll spend just a little bit of time on this uh, because it's fun also. Because again, it's good to examine application decisions over here. The key question over here is, which packet do you choose for a given output port? Uh, router, again, needs to prioritize between competing flits. Which input port should you prioritize? Which virtual channel, which applications packet do you prioritize? There are common strategies that have been used, as we discussed earlier, is round robin across virtual channels. It's a very simple scheduling policy, but it's clearly it does not very aware of applications. Oldest packet first, using an approximation of it, because this requires full priorities. Uh, or you prioritize some virtual channel over others, to provide quality of service. Uh, so we want basically better policies in multi-core environment in general uh, because we know about applications better. Right? This is actually true for large-scale networks like data center networks also. You want to prioritize. If you, you want to put, input your application knowledge into the design of the system. Uh, but we're going to look at the multi-core example. So basically, uh, the problem is uh, you have different applications sharing a network on chip very similar to they were sharing a cache and a memory controller. And the, which packets do you schedule first? So we're going to assume a buffered router, but it doesn't matter in the end. It's easier in a buffered router. So let's assume that you have lots of packets inside here. It's a congested network and yet, uh, from different applications. The key question is which packet do you choose over there? So existing policies, if you look at them, they're not aware of applications. Uh, it's not necessarily a good policy. So if you're not aware of applications, you have two problems. One is uh, the problem that we discussed. The decision that you make is local to a router. This router may prioritize one packet from application A. In the next router, that may get deprioritized. As a result, you have contradictor decision making between the routers. Uh, and this leads to inefficiency and performance loss. And this paper analyzes that problem. It's very interesting. It's very similar to what we discussed earlier. Within the bufferless router, you have contradictory decision making uh, between the switches, right? So the second problem is, independently of this, your application obliviates because you're treating all applications packets equally and this is not necessarily a good thing uh, because we know that applications are different, right? Applications are heterogeneous. 
And we want to have more heterogeneous policies, more application-aware global scheduling policies. So that's the idea in this paper. So I'm going to give you the basic idea. I'm not going to go into the details of it. But let's assume that this is the packet injection order at the processor. Uh, this particular core has injected a lot of uh, packets. This particular has injected two, and this one injected one. Uh, and let's assume that uh, you, uh, we're going to use something similar to parallelism over batch scheduling. It's not going to be exactly the same, but batching is a good way of providing for starvation freedom. So it's a fundamental principle. If you want to ensure that things make progress, you want to use batching sometimes. Uh, okay, basically you mark uh, these packets belonging to batches, and this paper uses time-based batching, because if you're over a network, if you want to preserve the batch, how do you actually preserve the batch? Whenever you inject, you actually put a batch number into the, uh, uh, into the packets such that all of the routers know which batch this packet belongs to. And then what we're going to do is we're going to rank the uh, packets uh, applications based on which one is more latency sensitive or uh, bandwidth sensitive. In this case, this one's more latency sensitive because if this little packet gets delayed behind this one, you're going to lose a lot of performance overall, system performance. So the ideas, as you can see, are very similar. In the end, you're doing scheduling, and a lot of the fundamental principles that we've discovered with memory controllers are going to be applicable to the networks also, except this is in a distributed setting. But we're going to look at a local router in this case. So basically, the router needs to schedule these applications. Let's assume you pick round robin. Round robin scheduling leads to a schedule that looks like this. If time goes from left to right, this is what happens. It's round robin across the virtual channels, as you can see. So basically, stall cycles that you get with round robin are very high. You can see the stall cycles by the, the uh, last time unit, uh, the time unit uh, at which the last packet uh, of a particular application is uh, finished. So for a green application, it's eight time units. For the red one, it's 11 time units. And the average is very high. If you do it age-based, let's assume the numbers over here uh, designate age. Then you get, again, an application unaware policy. In this case, it happens to be better, but not much better. Now, if you are more application aware, if you rank the applications such that the latent sensitive ones are ranked higher, you first schedule packets from them, and then the second ranked, and then the third ranked application. And as a result, you get much better uh, uh, average uh, stall cycles, average uh, service. You can think of this as average service time across application, or of the different applications. So this is very similar to what we discussed earlier, right? Latency sensitive applications are prioritized. It, it has similarities to, and it, uh, the principle of ranking we use for, from parallelism or batch scheduling. Um, and also uh, the prioritizing latency sensitive applications, we used uh, that in many contexts, certainly thread cluster memory scheduling. So again, this is a scheduling problem and similar solutions are applicable. Then the question is, of course, how do you do the batching? But the pay, uh, I'm not gonna go into that. The paper has more detail. Okay, so if you're interested, that's the paper. Take a look. So there are a lot of other ideas actually that you can develop uh, in a network if you want to optimize performance. Uh, it turns out, uh, this is a very interesting one because it turns out uh, you have a lot of slack uh, in the service time of packets. Some packets are more critical. So if an application has a lot of memory level parallelism, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, let's say it sent out five packets out, five read requests somehow. Uh, its progress is really bottlenecked by the last one that's coming from the network. And the last one may take a long time. The first one may take not so long time, which means that the first one has a lot of slack. It can be delayed until the last one comes back, approximately, right? Because there are some, uh, there's some progress that you can enable in the core. But uh, if you think of it in an abstract manner, uh, if, if the application can make progress only after all of the five requests come back, you're really bottlenecked by the last one that comes back. Which means that you can delay all of the packets that you sent to the same time as the last one, uh, to the same time at which the last one is going to come back. That's the idea. You somehow figure out the slack that you have in each packet, and you prioritize the packets that have less slack over others. I think this, again, a fundamental principle. As long as you can do this in an easy way, you really want to uh, schedule things based on Slack. So Slack can be based on the last packet arriving because you're not making progress until the last one arrives, so there's a lot of Slack on the other ones that are supposed to arrive earlier or that could arrive earlier. Or it could be based on some deadline, right? 
We've seen this actually in uh, accelerators. If you, if you actually know that you don't need the packet to arrive until this point, you know that you have some slack in the servicing of that packet, and you prioritize the packet that has the least slack in the system. And this actually leads to significant performance, uh, and the paper has a lot more detail, which again, I'm not going to go into over here. So there are a lot of other issues in on-chip networks or networks in general, quality of service is one. Uh, we're not going to tackle that, we don't have time. Actually, let me see how much time we have. Yeah, we don't have that much time. Uh, and, but there, it's very interesting, especially low cost quality of service mechanisms are really important. And there's a lot of work on the internet, but on-chip networks are lacking actually in this domain. And this is actually very interesting work uh, that has a particular idea, which maybe I will talk about very quickly. So basically, uh, what if you want to design an extremely large scale network? like thousands of nodes. Uh, you want to be extremely efficient for sure, no question about that. Uh, but you want to do some other things also. And we want to provide quality of service also. This paper tackles this grand problem, if you will. You want to design a very large scale network uh, on chip. Uh, and you want to provide service guarantees, you want to be scalable, you want to be energy efficient, you want to be high performance. I'm not going to go through all of the details over here. Uh, but I'm going to give you the idea related to quality of service especially. So this is all you want actually from a very large scale network. And the idea, the, uh, a, a big novelty in this paper is, uh, if you want to have quality of service in your network, if you want to put it in each router, it's expensive. Basically, yes, you have buffering, but now you need to have more buffering to designate, to distinguish between different quality of service classes. You need to do arbitration, depending on what kind of quality of service you want to provide. You need to do bookkeeping for each flow in the network, even though it may not be occupying buffers at that point in time. So there's a lot of overhead to provide quality of service uh, to different flows or different applications in the network. And actually there's one proposal that we had uh, that makes it much more cost effective, but it's still expensive actually. So uh, the goal is to provide quality of service guarantees at low area and power cost because having it across 10,000 routers and every router enforcing those quality of service guarantees is not simple. So the idea in this work is to have isolation. Basically create a region in the network uh, where the shared resources are isolated and you support quality of service only within that area. Everything else is quality of service free. And design the topology so that applications can access the region without interference. That's the interesting part. Now we're going to modify the topology such that we support this quality of service aware region. So if you look at a baseline quality of service available, uh, enabled chip multiprocess, it looks like this. Quality of service is everywhere in the routers. And this example actually shows concentration also. Basically, you have four nodes uh, connected to a router, and you have uh, four by four of these four nodes, as you can see. And you can see that these are shared resources over here, uh, and these are pr private resources. And you have quality of service enabled routers everywhere. And you, can, you may have a mapping of virtual machines look like this. Virtual machine may be mapped to these cores, for example, number one. Uh, virtual machine number two may be mapped to these cores. Virtual machine number three may be mapped to these cores. Uh, yeah, okay, I guess I've already said that. So uh, in this case, there are some downsides. You, uh, there, the contention scenarios are whenever you want to access shared resources, you have memory accesses, you have contention. You may have intra-virtual machine traffic. You may have inter-virtual machine traffic that leads to uh, essentially contention. So whenever you want to access a shared resource, for example, you, and this other virtual machine wants to access that shared resource, you have contention over here. So that's why you need to provide quality of service in the routers that are over here. So we don't want to do that, actually. We want to provide network-wide guarantees without network-wide quality of service support. So the idea with Kilonoka is this. Uh, we, basically, we have a lot of in network connectivity on chip. Uh, and we can use that naturally to reduce interference among flows. And uh, this, uh, by doing that, we will limit the extent of hardware quality of service support in their routers. Basically, we're going to use a topology as an enabler for reducing the quality of service support, as a result, improving the efficiency. So this requires a low diameter topology. That's why a low diameter is good, actually, in general. And uh, we had some other work in the past called multi-drop express channels. It's a low diameter topology. It's actually a very simple idea. It basically says you have a link over here. You have uh, treated as a multi-drop bus. So this is really a bus that has drops in each of these uh, nodes over here. 
And we're going to take advantage of that multi-drop bus. And it turns out this, this is, of course, it's a trade-off. This doesn't buy you the highest performance. This doesn't always buy you the highest efficiency, but it gives you very high scalability and very high efficiency in general without getting you to the highest performance in all traffic patterns. So it's not good for all traffic patterns, but it's, it's actually a good topology if you want to achieve low, di low diameter. So the idea over here is we're going to use that topology to reach these dedicated quality of service enable regions. So we're going to designate some part of the chip as quality of service enabled. Rest of the die is quality of service free. And then uh, we're going to map our virtual machines or whatever applications. And you can see that the cost has reduced significantly to begin with. Now, how do you actually ensure that this virtual machine has non-interfered access to this quality of service uh, 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 area, if you will? We basically provide traffic, uh, traffic isolation using uh, a, a low diameter topology. And the topology in this case is a multi-drop express channels, but you can actually have some other things. So this way, this region can access, um, uh, so this virtual machine can access this region with its own link, and this virtual machine can access its own region, uh, I I this region with its own link, and they do not interfere with each other. So that's the advantage of having a topology that looks like this. It's low diameter, this can access directly this region, and this region can also access directly, this region can also access directly. As you can see, they have separate links, and these links don't interfere with each other. Okay, and if you want to actually uh, communicate between this virtual machine and this virtual machine, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do that anymore because you would contend with this virtual machine. So we're going to disallow that sort of communication. We're going to force that communication to go through the quality of service of our region. So that's the cost that you pay. You basically don't want to interfere with this one. As a result, you go through the quality of service of our region to communicate with uh, other parts of uh, your virtual machine or the application. Right. So that's the idea basically. The quality of service of a region is limited. You use topology to reach that quality of service region, uh, every region with, in an isolated manner across different applications and you ensure that applications do not interfere with each other in the non-quality of service region. And uh, there's a lot more other optimization that's done over here. Basically, there's optimized flow control that reduces the buffer requirements in the quality of service free regions. You should take a look at that. There's a lot of work in optimizing buffering resources, and uh, this work takes it to the next step. Uh, let's take a look at the results very quickly. So if you actually do all of this, uh, this is a baseline network. It's very optimized, actually. This multi-drop express channels plus uh, this preemptive virtual clock quality of service mechanism that we had developed. Uh, Basically, router area is huge, as you can see. Uh, if you use what we've discussed, uh, you actually uh, reduce the router area, uh, overall area, network area significantly. Even with buffered networks. We're not eliminating buffering here. We still have buffers. And buffers actually still consume a lot uh, of the area, as you can, uh, well, it's not obvious in this figure. Uh, but the quality of service uh, aware region uh, actually occupies the screen part. So there's a lot of uh, area that's dedicated to quality of service of a region in this case. Energy comparison, energy is actually pretty good compared to the baseline again. It's not as good as this other one over here, but that other one also has high area. Uh, that other one you can, uh, so this has elect elastic buffering uh, and also quality of service of our regions. And there's more work, uh, uh, more examples over here that I'm not going to go into since we don't have time. So basically, this is an example of the complexity of network. I've glossed over a lot of detail over here, but basically you want to provide quality of service, you want to minimize area as much as possible, maximize scalability, uh, minimize buffering, maximize energy efficiency. And this one example of a network design that does that, and there are several ideas, uh, and it does provide strong guarantees in terms of uh, uh, quality of service in this case. Okay. And this is not what I'm going to talk about, but you can have the slides for your own. <laughs> this basically talks about uh, how to make low diameter topologies. Uh, uh, and I think low diameter topologies are very good in general for latency. So it's good to look at low diameter at low cost going forward. Any questions? No questions? Okay. So next week we have an exam. <laughs> I hope you'll prepare. I would suggest doing the homework because homework is actually uh, 
good for the exam in general. <laughs> uh, yes? Just to clarify, it's on Thursday, not Wednesday, right? Yes, yes, exam is Thursday. Thursday. Uh, wait, wait, 20th. Yeah, it's the last day of classes, basically. Last day of our class. I don't know if, if it's the last day of classes. Yeah, it's on Thursday. On Wednesday, what should we do on Wednesday? Should we, should we have a review session? Should we have fun? Should we have another lecture? You won't be responsible if there is another lecture. Any thoughts? Review. You would like the review? Yes. yes, for sure. Okay. Yeah, then we'll have a review session on Wednesday. Sound good? Okay. Any burning questions before we part? And by the way, the exam will be more focused on the second half of the course. Let me put it that way. <laughs> Technically, it's the entire course, but we're not going to... Uh, I mean, there might, be some, you, there might be some basic knowledge that you need from the entire course, of course, but you can expect most of the questions to be from the second part. Okay, I guess I'll see you next week. Have a good weekend.